And again, you know, with movies like, and this is my biggest criticism, I mean, I can, I can tear the movie apart uh, line by line, but the biggest criticism is it, it sets up another ahistorical generation. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have the history of Marvel Comics, right. you know, and how this was invented as something that was very neutral, that the white liberal could take very palpable, but never really knowing why it was taken up as a, as a logo, if you will, by the Black Panther Party, what they signified, how they were destroyed from within by the FBI. And the problem is, is that basically the CIA is, is present in this movie who actually keeps the neutralization and the white liberal fantasy going. Right. You know, in, in, in the movie. Right. It's very strange the way this is set up. And the real Black Panthers are thugs. You know, the other yeah. the other character, right. Michael, what's his name, P. Jordan uh, character, is, is presented as a thug who's out to kill. His name is Killer something. Killmonger. Yeah. Yeah, Killmonger. 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 Wait, in the, the film. The logo was initially before Marvel. It was before the formation of the party. There was a political group. They had a Black Panther. Then Marvel created it, and then the Black Panther. Who party. was who was the one before? I, it was in the South. I mean, it was prefigured. It was prefigured. Yeah. Pre I don't remember the name of the group that then formed well, the Black Panther. 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 The first Black Panther was, was a Southern then? organization. Yeah. yeah, Southern organization. Yeah, it yeah, they had yeah. that yeah. first. So they're like they were like an armed group. Yeah. <laughs> I knew some of those. Bogalusa, Louisiana. They went to the lunch counters and they put the weapons down. You should have seen the faces. Now I'm, I'm growing up around this. Time. 1962. I mean, now when you search on the internet, when you start typing Black Panther, all you can see is. Comic, See, cast, yeah. box yeah. office, oh, it's yeah. eradicated yeah. erasure history. of memory, right there. Yeah. Eradicated yeah. history. I can't even see not in none of the predicative stuff. Is there any? Yeah, and then the of course we're going to hear all the stories about. I mean, this is how the propaganda works. It's w empowering women. That's yes, as guardians. There's one right. attractive character. She's the healer, the sister, who's very good with the technology. Listen, one way of reading this, you know, to look at this mm. is the allegory of the Congo. You know, the, because there's a mineral that they have Coltan. that everybody wants. Yes. Yeah. And Coltan. it's called vibra, 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 oh. vibrata or something in this. <laughs> but it's know. a metaphor yes. for cold. Yes, it is. Because for it's what? absolutely Coltan. necessary. It's for necessary for laptops, mm. phones. Yeah. Everything you yeah. use. Everything, everything you do. Yeah. 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 We have it, too. The expense, it the, the expense is good. about four million dead just in the Congo alone, in yeah. terms of tribal warfare and setting up all kinds of conflict zones, you know, within the country to get the mining rights and to control the mines. Well, yeah. and after the assassination of Lumumba. Clinton, Clinton yeah. set it up in the, uh, you know, with uh, Uganda and uh, what's his face? Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, th those are. Right. Uh, the, and none of this is really alluded to in the film at all. I mean, this is another problem with it. It really is a comics turned into something, but th let me say this. This is a $200 million initial investment, probably by, you know, big money. You know, this is the guy that did the thing about the subway, right, in, in L.A.? What was it called? The same director. The disaster. The film? fair oh, part, uh, oh. fair, the the junction. What was the name of it? Oh, it was Dale, Fruit Fruitdale Fruit 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 yeah. Fruit Fruit Station, station yeah. right? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, the no, no, that was in Oakland. In Oakland, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, Fruitdale Station. Yeah, so this yeah. guy obviously has a little bit of a politics, but now has gone the way of all flesh. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? In a sense. I want to see mean. Jordan Peele's Get Out, which has the white bourgeoisie I and cannibalism. I, 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 really? I hated it. Yeah, I know. You didn't I like it? it? Yeah. It's all about white cannibalism. Well, I mean, yeah. I think it's just is typical tropes of, you know. And I know it's supposed to be self. I, I, I just. I don't it had think it two up endings. To it. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. I didn't the like same it. Movie or two versions? But also, yeah. anyway, what can I yeah, say? I don't know. Not sure yeah. what I mean. But anyway, we'll, maybe we'll talk more about Black Rob can do more at dinner because I want to get through this. <laughs> here. So anyway, these are the two um, two moments um, um, here. Um, um, you know, basically, I also think in this dialogue that you really have what I would just call an unspoken dialogue, right? The unspoken 
um, you know, Nietzsche right in the way. But Heidegger is really trying to get to what is Nietzsche really saying here from, you know, this, these three, you know, uh, moments in history. And you have to always read Nietzsche with degrees of intensity, force, and limit. You always have to think Nietzsche in this sense. Where is the greatest force, the intensity? This is something that uh, Deleuze is, uh, has taught us as well as, you know, other, other um, uh, folks very much, uh, you know, on this, uh, you know, uh, um, what's the degree of force, what's the level of intensity, where is the limit, you know, what are the gradations, you know, in this, you know, so always keep this in mind when you're reading this stuff, that you know, all of these are intensities, right? There's degrees of force, gradations, right? Always remember this, because this gives you a much more multi-layered, it's not so simple, right? <laughs> you know, in a way, you begin to see the layers within it. And Heidegger's doing the same thing in terms of this future and the having been, and what's being preserved, you know, in terms of heritage, history, etc. Or, or the history as preservation, right? But then the present also is historicality, in which authenticity is able to, you know, be disclosed, right? Whether or not you're living authentically, right? For Nietzsche, the authenticity is here in the critical. Right? Your authenticity is really in the critical. Because you're always in movement. In the Judgment and you're giving condemnation to the things that you see as false. And that, mm -hmm. that keeps you moving. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need the judgment, the separation. Judgment in German is a good word. Urteil means to separate. That's where the word comes from. Yeah. When, when I read it, I, I mean, this is probably my reading. No, no, it's okay. I mean, yeah. was it's really, open. like, uh, it seems like he leveled the most intense criticism to the antiquarian, that he, he thought the monumental was very important and the critical very important. In a way. Yes, well, I mean, the monumental is, as you see, models and examples mm -hmm. and sketches, yeah. and these things can be remolded and reshaped. And all of this, right? Very and yeah. the destruction of all of them. Yes, the right, 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 right. I read it in Rome, so uh -huh. <laughs> you read it in Rome, Italy. You yeah, mean? so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah no it's like a little color. <laughs> <laughs> you got to read in the eternal, the eternal city, yeah. Instead of the, uh, instead of the emerald, yeah. city. I wanted to take it all down. <laughs> well, I mean, in a way, he does. I mean. Yeah. This is a sounding out, in a certain way, of the idols. This yeah. is a sounding out of the idols. And you could also think of Heidegger, too, too in terms of the hearing, is signed, sounding out the idols back here, right? The acting and the striving within German Romanticism. What does Holderlin mean? You know, you can do a lot with this, mm -hmm. this kind of dialogue, in a sense. But I hear you, Nietzsche's a, a great destroyer, yeah. as is Heidegger. Yeah. But Nietzsche is the great destroyer, right? In a, in, in a way, you know, yeah. he wants to take on Hegel, the great castrator, mm -hmm. by being the great destroyer of that that castration. I mean, the whole this is the this is the meaning to me, to my net, to my mind of the God is the dead hypothesis. Why this is so important mm -hmm. to Heidegger. To, Hegel, yeah. to me, of all the the commentary on Nietzsche, this is a, a seminal uh, essay, mm -hmm. you know, that he does. Seminal uh, thing. God is dead. God is dead. God is dead, the essay, the Nietzsche's word, it's called Nietzsche's Wort, <laughs> God is dead, <laughs> right? <laughs> the word of Nietzsche, God is dead, right? And then, you know, he's really, he really is, uh, this is excellent. And it opens up all kinds of possibilities. And as you probably know, Dostoevsky, in the mouth of uh, Karilov, uh, you know, says, if God is dead, everything is permitted. Yeah, in a way. And what does that open up in terms of the horizon and in terms of permittance? And what does this mean to be beyond good and evil? How do you start re-evaluating values going forward, etc.? Because we're in a very reductionist morality right now. I mean, this, this Me Too movement, with all due respect, again, uh, to uh, you know anybody that's traumatized, and we all know the systemic nature of the system and its power relations and all of this, but in a way, it's turning into a really moralism that's not going to get anywhere. You know, it's just going to hurt more, I, I think, ultimately. I mean, you know, I may be wrong. Well, Zizek said, if God is dead, nothing is permitted. <laughs> what do you think he meant by that? 
I think he, he's basically saying without the God that tells you what you can and cannot do, that nothing is permitted. Oh, I see. So you Everything need, uh, is thou shalt not. I see. I see. Who, who's oh, this? Zizek. Oh, Everything Zizek. is forbidden? Yeah, I'm not so sure yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's one of the great yeah. promoters of God is dead uh, and everything is permitted, right? Yeah. right? Um, he calls himself a Christian atheist. He's just trying to play with paradox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which well, is not the useful. first Christians were like called today. atheists. Well, listen, Rome, the best thing about Christianity is Nietzsche. The last Christian died on the cross. That's a devastating statement. <laughs> <laughs> because the Christians didn't observe state Roman religion, they were called atheists. Yeah, I mean, I understand the historical. I mean, that kind of that kind of uh, moment, but you know, in a way, yeah. I mean, what's he playing upon here? That somehow, you know, uh, Christ is, uh, you know, like the primitive communism. We're going to play with the uh, liberation theology here again, and you know, no, I mean, I don't think to me, he, it's not. Yeah, I yeah. don't think he is. I think he's trying to be anti-Nietzschean in that statement, but I don't think he believes that God is dead. Anti-Nietzschean in the sense that Nietzsche wants to go against um, the Christian ethos. Not so much oh. God, but, you know, the, the slave mentality. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that Nietzsche's main antagonist, and Heidegger too, when you start talking authenticity versus inauthenticity and Das Mann versus that of, you know, the authentic icon, you know, uh, uh, owning what's uh, proper to one's own, Yes, I mean they're they're against the slave uh, morality, yeah, and they see Christianity as being part of the slave morality. Yes, and re really the first revolt against aristocratic value. I mean Nietzsche is about a radical, you know, like it or not, this is no communist at work. This is about radical aristocracy, right? Ultimately, you know, and he doesn't mean aristocracy because of money. He's talking about an aristocracy of artists and poets and, you know. Those who are, you know, quite creators. It's an aristocracy of the creators and those who can break molds, break, you know, the past in a certain way. This, this is his highest. <coughs> the Ubermensch is really not only uh, someone that's overcoming the philosophical, the anthropos, the, the philosophical anthropology, but one who is able to break everything in its way. Right, in a sense, is an arch but, destructor and something that is over to overcome whatever. Yeah. Couldn't right at this moment have the left appropriation of this uh, idea of, of of sort of the moment of the Ubermensch, not as through the aristocratic like the Aristo of the best of those who can overcome the past. But we can generalize this as the communist project as well. So yes, of every course. human inheritor yes. has the possibility yes. to of recapture this, 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 this aspect this is of their, a, you which know, capitalism you're going to go through all these you know, like levels in terms of a critical whatever. thing, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And that capitalism and God, both right. of which are defunct systems, right? And this sounds <laughs> more rewarding than critique. even Marx's uh, critique of capitalism. I was going to say, Marx is a Christian atheist. Well, he never really, I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, okay, well, we're going to keep that, we'll you know, open ended. Yeah, I like this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like this as a thing, but I mean, I'm not, yeah. yeah, yeah. But go ahead, tell me what's on your mind. Yeah. No, no, I but mean, I mean, because would the be, Marxist argument is that the proletariat is, of course, you know, like by prioritizing the, you know, things like alienation, which are, which are close to, Heidegger's critique, right? Well, it's Heidegger's sort of talking about, yes. You know, well, uh, alienation and estrangement. Alienation. And, and he literally he talked about word. estrangement, yeah, yeah and alienation. Yeah, but, in the, but, but, but Nietzsche's critique is stronger than Marx's, I think, against, against liberal slash Christian order. I mean, he may apply to, to, to for some kind of a return to, to the aristocrats, sort of recapturing sort of their place <clears throat> in, in the world, but... No, I mean, he, he, the aristocrats that he is holding up, it's not just the class. Not the class, it's but really the best, the like in, the, in Aristotle's The notion. Borgias, 
you know, right. one of his great models is Caesar with the soul of Christ. Like Aristotle's notion of the best, those with merit. Yeah. Right? Those with merit, yeah. not the class of the few. Yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's Borgia, you know, it's certainly Napoleon, he's a right. Bonapartist. Right. Ultimately, I mean, he very much admires but we could say it could the be, risk of. It could be a student movement in 1968 or in Argentina struggling again. I mean, this is also an aristocratic moment. We could we could claim, right? If, to use Nietzsche's words, but to mean something, to expand its meaning, right? Like a mass movement that is aristocratic in this nature, that it it overcomes, you know, the uh, mediocrity of. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the problem with that is that the mass movement is not constituting. It's the constituting is coming from or whoever the, the constitutes class, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, who, yeah. who's constituting. The leadership. You have or to the think party about this. This is about the constitutive, you know, it's not about constitutive power, it's about constitutive right. power. Mm -hmm. yeah? Marx would not agree about Napoleon either. No, I know that. Yeah. But it's the Leninist approach, I mean, really, in one sense. Well, I mean, in a way, I mean, the, 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 the world conquering... The vanguard. The world conquering the internationalism yeah. Yeah. is basically out of Napoleon. I mean, without Napoleon, you don't have a sense of vanguard of, of internationalism. You know, I mean, we have to think about this seriously. I understand the critique of Napoleon, and I'm not a Bonapartist. I have friends that are Bonapartists. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but, yeah. The woman at yeah. Fordham wrote a whole book on... Uh, Who's this? Babbage. Babbage? Babbage? No. Is it Babbage? On, on what? On uh, uh, the uh, Nietzsche's influence on... Uh, yeah, Nietzsche Babbage. and science. Yeah, she wrote a good book on Nietzsche and science and probably, you know, some other stuff. Yeah, she's a, you know, to a degree. She's a Nietzsche and Heideggerian and, you know, yeah. 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 Not a whole lot of style, you know. Mm. She, yeah, she, her teacher was, she always mentions this, was Gadamer, you know, Hans, Hans Jörg Gadamer. I studied with Gadamer. Every time you see him, I studied with Gadamer. And so, <laughs> he lived to be 103. Did he know younger? That's always my question. Did you know well, that's what you do with him sometimes. Did you know, do you know younger? <laughs> yeah, anyway. No, I'm, you mentioned Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to get in trouble here. Anyway, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, um, yeah, going back to this, I mean, look, I, I, I don't think it's right to, to take this thought in a sense. I mean, look, in terms of intensities, if you read Ubermensch as a question of over intensities, over man intended, and ten, as tendencies, and this is a limit and a line, then you can talk about energy fields that are going to be used, you know, in terms of mass movements. But the problem is, in terms of all the mass movements, is you know there's always still this desire for authority or something like that, and it's always been a problem of yeah. of, of you know didacticism, right? Oversimplification. And, and oversimplification, yeah. and, and thirdly of all, I mean, is there always that liberation, you know, that's coming, you know, <laughs> you know, out of this? What what really happens, you know? I mean, look 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 at the unions today in a certain way. I mean, what are we going to talk about in terms of the proletariat or the working class or these kind of, uh, you know, yeah. It's yeah. almost like we have to rewrite, we yes. reconceptualize yeah, the you have to reconceptualize of what, yes. organization. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely, yeah. Because none of, none of them are, wor are working at this point, yeah. And, and, you know, again, you have to remember, too, that, you know, these, these movements in, in the Bolsheviks, et cetera, these were secret societies. These were not public, you know. I mean, they met, but really, in a way, they operated very secretively. Yeah, <laughs> you know, any kind of revolutionary movement would work. Here, you know, you're not just going to go to the left forum and you know get a group. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? You know, and how you been? And you know, yeah, I you remember mean, you. The revolution is not going to rise out of the left forum. 1969. No, I don't think so. Not, <laughs> especially with Jane Sanders being the. Uh, the plenary speaker. Um, I don't know what, how they, what they're thinking about. Who's that? Uh, Jason. The wife. Uh, the wife. What? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the son ran for something too, he's right? Run, no, uh, yeah, his son's running for New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> so real. Congress, <laughs> Listen, as long as you stay trapped within the thinking, of, I mean, the great thing about this, it, it just throws into question anything about representative mm -hmm. politics, parliamentary democracy, any kind of liberal form of electoral politics, you know, et cetera. I mean, you may have a direct democracy. You know, if you're thinking in terms of how this would work in terms of direct democracy or the seizure, you know, when people like Invisible Committee or, you know, some of these groups, they're, they're pretty Nietzschean in their movements, the energies. You know, you can look around the salvage group, which is very smart. I mean, I've read some of their pieces, Seymour and Melville, and these, these people are good. I, I don't think you wasted your money uh, subscribing to that. Uh, I, let the, I let the subscription oh, you run did? out. What, what happened? You got between salvation it and went, garbage, no more salvage? It was so expensive. <laughs> yes, I know. Getting it from uh, the UK. Yeah. 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 That, the, by the you way, that someone foreign... someone that's flying to the UK to pick it yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that foreign professor was Bernice Gleitzer. Um, oh, okay. And she wrote uh, from from Nietzsche to. Uh, oh yeah, she's good. I know who she yeah, is. Uh, yeah. Russia, Nietzsche and Russia. Russia too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's very good. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I, I I'm I'm with you here. I mean, I think it's very important uh, uh, to 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 think this this term outside of it's just a Superman. You know, et cetera. Yeah, certainly, you know, to Heidegger's mind, Junger is an Ubermensch. Yeah. There's no question about it. The warrior, this comes, the Ubermensch may be even a play, if you want to go back to the antiquarian and even the monumental of Plato's Guardians. You know? Yeah? In some ways. But then the question is, you know, the Guardians are always guarding the state. The Guardians are not undermining the state. <laughs> Right? And, and yeah, you know, this is the function of the guardians. And Nietzsche, in some senses, is very close to Plato, you know, despite his critiques. You know, there are these affinities, you know, that are, that are happening, uh, you know, because his future is about, you know, the, we, we are the guardians of culture. Mm -hmm. So heritage is also a way. So there is a kind of radical, I mean, I'll put radical <clears throat> here on the line, conservatism here. Yeah, you know, radical conservatism that wants a preservation, if you will, of the heritage at, at some levels, right? Although Nietzsche really, I think, realizes at the time that, you know, you have to, you know, think, or at least how we would read him today, as you go into the 21st century, what kind of figures do we need in order to confront the, the monstrosity, right, et cetera? You know, what, what is serious about, you know, us today? You know, in a way, what 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 seriously can really be done? Yeah. So when you say homo datum, you know, they were become from homo economicus, from homo sapiens to homo sexualis to homo datum now, right? What what what, you know, ultimately does that yield in terms of well, yeah. figures and leaders going forward? I mean, where I'm right does now, does the is... hacker become? Does the hacker become the? The Ubermensch does the, you know, yeah, yeah. Where I'm now is that, yeah, yeah. like, Foucault in the 79 lectures, right, shows that the big political project of neoliberalism is the, the um, equi like, drawing equality lines between the, in the neoliberal minds, between the economic structures of capitalism yes. and the political structures. And, and then right. Deleuze shows, this is my reading, that Deleuze shows that the goal is the erasure of politics itself, liberal politics, ideas like, public uh, and private, the social contract, yes. right? So yeah. the idea is politics is the area for the capitalist thinkers like Becker, the economist from Chicago. Human capital. Right. The problem is the problem for the capitalists in terms of social reproduction is right. is, is is the political because the political is where the possibility for the Ubermensch can cannot be fully controlled. As long right. as there's a vibrant, right. functional, political right. Right. thinking about political mm -hmm. concepts right. like right. freedom and autonomy. Right. Right. So if they can erase that or fully redefine it as economics, using, re that's why mm -hmm. the neoliberals... Policing really economics is better. Because right. in a way, they need the police state, the surveillance state, right. in order to enact that. So you should always use the phrase, it's not only the economic... Right. You know, they need the policing economics. Right, because of the moment. because and Becker, that's what economics Foucault does. Shows, Foucault yeah. shows that outside Becker, of the politics. Yeah, yeah, Becker redefines yeah. the word freedom, for example. So freedom for the for Becker and these other smart neoliberals is 
freedom is essentially uh, redefined through the through essentially through the movement of capital yes. and its requirements. It's not a political concept anymore. No. Not even a liberal political concept. That's right. Right. So yeah. so Foucault is basically very nervous about this. He sees the danger of that because yes. once you have generations that are apolitical or depoliticized right, sure. that way, it's over. What like, happens? So the system becomes very stable. 79 was a, a right. turning so point. So homo datum is, is I think, the, 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 the first actualization of, of that. Okay, I see. You know? okay. So how do we get out of that? Like, how do we re-engage with the, with the political, right. you know, as the okay. prime area of... Uh, okay. Yeah. Could we say that culture is always reactionary or at least conservative? And that unless we forge a new culture, we're stuck in the conservative culture of the past. I'm thinking of the French Revolution. Tell me what you mean. I mean about the French Revolution and this concept. Well, the sorry, French yeah. Revolution tried to establish a whole new cultural uh, language, a whole new lingua franca, and so did the Russian Revolution. Yes. So there was a jettisoning of the old culture as right. conservative. Right, And sure. maybe one of the issues is that we need to somehow invent a new culture. That's the avant-garde. Well, that's always the yeah. avant-garde's yeah. role. That's yeah. why I'm saying, you know, earlier on, I hear you. And But I mean, why I'm saying that, you know, there is no future because there is no avant-garde. Because we ain't there yet. <laughs> We're not there. I mean, we can recycle, you know, and we can sit here and talk about every great movement from Bauhaus to our house, you know. But whatever, I'm saying you know, get, but, rid <laughs> get rid of the old. Get rid of the old. Right, right. right. Yeah. Get rid of the old. Well, what does that mean to get rid of the old? I mean, that that's another question that I'm kind of interested in because... Anti-Nietzsche. Nietzsche wants to have a, a su superior cultural uh, antiquarian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in order to be good revolutionaries, we need to jettison that. I mean, but again, what would what would you I mean, what would you think of here? I mean, the labor unions could never build a culture around labor. You know, you had a little bit of popular songs and you know some marches and stuff like that, but it never really was a culture of artists and you know, you know, creative. Uh, you did, yeah, what yeah. did Ru the yeah. Russians do in yeah. the revolution? What do you mean? Well, they, they created had, they built new yeah. art, new well, new. They, they just they subsumed the unions under the party. Yeah, because yeah, the union exactly. didn't make sense because yeah. it was you know, I'm talking about culture. No, of oh, course, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I had, yeah, everybody from Eisenstein to Vertov to to you know these great figures in in, in linguistics and in uh, you know the uh, literary studies, every, everything. Yes, of course, yeah. But uh, again, wh where is that today? Where are the elements of that today? Because Eisenstein, you know, knew the Lumiere brothers, knew Melise, he right. knew the history of cinema. Exactly. Just they like the history of painting, yeah. painting was breaking. such as, you know, uh, Rochenko knew what came before him, right? Mm -hmm. You know, these were educated people. These yeah. were people that had something around that. To me, the struggle is, always, is really about how mm -hmm. do you develop a pedagogy of you know not only liberation I mean that's a Frarian moment uh, it seems to me we're we're much much worse off today we don't even have that possibility mm -hmm. for a pedagogy that enters subjectivity maybe maybe to a little bit of a degree but we we, we really need you know <laughs> a pedagogy that even has historical sense not much less historical meaning so this to me seems to be the real struggle that's going on you know that the memory the history has been com completely homo datum, digitalized, you know, industrialized, that, you know, you can access anything on, you know, with the finger now, it's in the machine, and we're so in the machine that we can't think outside the machine, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're in the machine, always, right, in, in a sense. So where is that going to come from? I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I'm all for building a new culture and starting afresh. But again, I don't think there's ever been, you know, I mean, complete ruptures. The ruptures that are happening out here now, the breaks, are really in mathematics. These are the new, you know, this is where all the work is going on in terms of, you know, new dimensions and, you know, and space and 
this is this is where the the, the quote unquote energy is going, you know, and and the funding. But it's interesting, like yeah. Yeah. having read I mean, when a, you really like, think about that this, that yeah. do book yeah. and his yeah. notes on yeah. seminar, and I just don't see where maybe that's why Heidegger. I just don't see the usefulness of mathematical modeling in politics. It just doesn't seem to be very Well, I don't fruitful. know about it in politics, but the mathematical modeling is something that is quote unquote breaking all the time with the yeah. previous. You know, right. there's always right. there's always something new in the mathematical journals. Yeah. Whereas in the humanities journals it's a kind of recycling of jargon and terms and you know, we're gonna yeah. use this for this essay, I'm gonna use this, you know, choose your theorist uh, yeah. kind of that mentality. You know, in a way. So I'm. I mean, I'm all for. I mean, I'm the first one. I'd be, you know, uh, out there on the front lines. Uh, you know, with. But the, you want me to come up with where it is and define it. So that, but, yeah, something like that. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know if it can be defined. If yeah. we read Heidegger carefully enough, is the quite the, the the bigger the larger question is what is what is the you know the. the the presupposition in Heidegger is that there, in, in us there is already a comprehension of being. How does that process again kick in, if you, you know, uh, in, in a way, you know? With, with God is dead. With the end of, you know, I mean, that we're still in habit, but we're still, you know, chipping away in the destruction of Western metaphysics. How do we open the question in terms of otherwise thinking? How do we begin to ask the questions very differently? You know, because I don't think we're at any near close to the solutions. I think we don't have the right questions yet. I think we can figure out how we got here all the time. You know, we can figure that out. The question is, is, is I mean, the, que is, or the question to me is asking the question in such a way that it's not only signaling something or not only signing something, but it becomes part of real thinking. You know, and I agree with him. We haven't begun to think. You know, we we're not in the process. You know, I mean, you know, and and remember, everybody in this room has somewhat of a me good memory, right? <laughs> in a way, you know, that's that's not operative in our culture at all, and you know, and especially in the United States, which has always been exceptionalism at work. You know, and why we have this attitude: I got my rights. I can do this, you know, you know, you know, the attitudes out here, you know, and this is a work of genius, this exceptionalism, work of genius in terms of political control. I mean, the Chicago School gives it at a higher level with human capital and Becker and these people. Human capital the, is defined that the everybody has capital. Take the politics out of economics. That's yeah. the definition. Everything Everyone, has, we're all own we all capital, capital and our own labor. You're so capital. it's like an incredibly You're not brilliant... Being, your like capital. Subversive definition of even Adam Smith. Yeah, like right, we own right. capital, so yeah. everybody's a capitalist. That's the Chicago <laughs> school. It and immigration is an investment in your own capital. Yes, That's how they define it. That's right. Yeah. So if you fail, it's your fault. So, so there's yeah. a built-in yeah. racism. If if you fail in, in developing your own capital, it's your fault. It's your flaw. By but your innate deficiencies. Yeah. This goes back to the you know the, the equality of uh, of um, results and the equality of opportunity. Yeah. In the 19th century, mm -hmm. the equality of res result was life is a, is a foot race or it's a race to the finish line. The aristocrats get to start at the finish. Mm -hmm. Everybody else starts at the, uh, the, the, the beginning line. <laughs> the equality of opportunity comes around, oh, okay, let's make the game fair. Everybody's gonna start at the starting line. You know? And if you don't make it, it's because you, have, you are innately deficient, you know, in this sense. You're innately a, a, a deficient. And what does that do to the system? You know, the, it has a natural, a quote unquote natural sorting out process, right? You weren't fast enough for the race. You weren't good enough for that school. You weren't good enough for that job, et cetera. Takes away every other historical factor that may go into this. And how does this work in our society? Every day. How do we address the problem of uh, equality? Quota systems through affirmative action. Well, Not education. And, uh, well, yeah, whatever a meritocracy is. It ain't working. A meritocracy ain't working out here right now, <laughs> believe me. Yeah. yeah, but think about this. You know, this is what one slogan of the front, you know, just take a, a, three values that the left has had. Three basic values. Freedom, liberty, right? In a way, right? Where, where is that today? Who really even talks about that? In the United States, it's freedom to shop, you know? Yeah, Not freedom to move. Well, it's consumerism, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. 
But what what freedom really mean? You know, here is there's freedom well, it's is apolitical. Misled, it's yeah, it's, it's a totally apolitical empty. concept. That's yeah. the it's completely that's economic. That's what Foucault was saying. You that's buy the a home, of, yeah. is your freedom. You can have that American dream. You know, the dream itself, the dream machine, the ability to shop anytime you want, and the ability to travel. And that's freedom not freedom. To vote. That's too something. Well, of course you have the freedom to vote too. Yeah, and then for whom? For and Tweedledum or Tweedledee. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. And uh, so you know that that's one level. Look at the question of equality. We're not even close. I think now that the you know despite all this kind of new hustle and flow capital in the black black community out there, right, and, you know, certain gains made in the marketplace, that the ownership of the, the, the United States is less than it was uh, t 25 years ago. I think there's statistics that are no, starting to bear this out, out, right? No, no they, they are. They came out about real yeah. estate and, and wealth. And, and they did, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes to show you right here. Ever. We came a long way in this right. post-racial era, right? <laughs> nowhere at all. <laughs> right, nowhere at all. So that's another thing, too. I mean, you have to remember, this is a country, 1865, you know, people are given, you know, the abolition of slavery and then the right to vote and can become from three-fifths to a full person. It took a hundred years after that to even get a civil rights bill passed mm -hmm. in the Congress. This is this is the worst form of neoliberal gradualism, you know, that we're going, you know, yeah, yeah. And it's before that it's not even neoliberal. So th think about this and think about the third term, fraternity, you know, brotherhood, right, or sisterhood in this ocean. Where do you have that operative? Not in any of the organizations, right, that are, that are going on. You know, in fact, an Ernst Junger probably has a greater sense a of great brotherhood. He has a great about about liberalism. Yeah, yeah. Like, he says, his critique of liberalism, he says, on one level, he says, for what is liberalism? It establishes a concept of freedom applicable like a fixed rule, contentless in itself, to any matter we may, we may wish to subject it to. Rather, in opposition, it has always been the case that the measure of freedom possessed by any force corresponds precisely to the measure of obligation assigned to it. I mean, it's, so this, you establish these rules of equality and access and they're totally meaningless. Right. It, it, it totally right. makes life meaningless because it doesn't make right. any sense like right. to organize it that way. Yeah, this here, this school here, the reason you have some of these buildings here is because of a racist profiteering model. You let everybody in, you get them in, you know, you have a retention rate of 20 to 25 mm percent, -hmm. you know, et cetera. This is why I work my tail off here. I feel for these kids. It's like I the mean, MCC, to be honest, yeah, yeah. the same thing. Ah. So you have this, this kind of level, this kind of level where you let everybody in. You can yeah, go to college, you know, just get your GED or your thing. You let everybody in, but by the time they get here, they're not prepared. You know, and there are very few professors that are going to sit there and go line by line on their papers and teach them how to read and write, or you know, try to can who can read or write. I had to jump. I had to jump quickly there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get me started on this one. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Right. But anyway, I mean, you think about this, and in, in, in a sense. What does this mean? I mean, you know, in terms of e equality and, and you know, the, these these values that the left has, they're completely empty today, completely. So when you say we're going to build a culture, what are we going to build the culture on? What is the pr you need a principle, right? You know, you needed a principle of justice in ancient society to build the Athenian city state. You know, the part of the Athenian city state was the redistribution of wealth. Right, you go in the the you know the age of Pericles really is Solon and Cleanthes, right? This is the beginning or the birth of democracy, right? That you have deems that will be represented by your property, right? And everybody had you know some kind of representation, etc. You know, and how how do you how do you work with this? This is built on a principle of justice and proportion. What do we have? I mean, really, in all honesty, what's everything measured by? It's what's in your wallet, right? This is the measure that we're, you know, that we're fighting all the time, you know, uh, constantly. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X called it dollarism. Um, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Samuel Jackson says, "What's in your wallet?" And he gets paid a lot to, to do the uh, the commercial wow. for yeah. Capital One, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, honestly, I mean, you know, look at the re the reversals here that are going on. So when I say, and I'll stand by this, where's the avant-garde? 
Where's the future? And what would be the principle on what you're going to build? What you know, you have to have something out there to give, mm. right? <laughs> to build a new culture. You know, you have to have something to build, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I have I'm not the against answer, it. I'll I'm write waiting the for book. Chris. <laughs> Chris, I got the white horse ready. You know, unless you want a black stallion. <laughs> right, right, right. Either way, go to the I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah. <laughs> you saw That movie is warping your brain. What movie? Uh, the Black Panther? <laughs> the Black Stallion. No, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, from yeah, the all. movie. <laughs> what movie is that? Oh, I never saw that. <laughs> he never, never saw, saw that. that. <laughs> I'm just playing. Listen, you started this earlier with the bestiary. <laughs> <laughs> But you interpret the <laughs> <reality. laughs> So anyway, we have very good study here for uh, work. No. <laughs> and Deleuze couldn't come up with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You know, you have to think about this. For Nietzsche, it was a return to an aristocratic radicalism. You know, isn't that the for Heidegger? Of... It's the you know the beginning of this kind of you know nation state that's in communication with a great you know Greek classical age or the pre-Socratic age when direct intuition a, was still operative before we became that. totally corrupted by system. That's part of Adorno's critique of Heidegger. The way I understand is that why does he have to always look back to the, this idealized Athenian? Yes, that's true. Why does he do that? And is can we do it differently? Yes, yeah. we can, yeah. So yeah. I can think of many calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you want to be like the Mayans? You know, you talk about a rigid hierarchical uh, society in some ways, but everything functioned, right? I mean, you can you can go back and look at all these uh, kind of cultures. You know what the Aztecs thought about yeah. the afterlife? That all the all the good people who live their lives properly, they become hummingbirds oh, as so a reward. Nice. So all the hummingbirds. So tell the Pentagon yeah. they're going to spend a lot of money studying this <laughs> reincarnation. Yeah. And they like, fought wars, the Aztecs. Yeah. The intention was not to kill the opponent, but to stun right. them. Right. So they can be. So they they fought the Spanish, and they're like they're trying to kill us. This makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I I think what we really need is a, is I'm um, been thinking about. It. I mean, you know, at one level is this kind of. Um, this kind of pedagogy of rupture. We just have to really constantly think from the outside back in. We're so inside the machine right now, we're so inside all of this that we have forgotten in some ways not only how to think, but how to, you know, really I question and life. pose the questions. And yes, enjoy life, the Dionysian earth. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And without joy, it's not worth yeah. anything. Yeah, Do you think right. a new kind of an asceticism would play a role here, too? What like kind of, I don't like know, I'm not into asceticism. <laughs> <laughs> in case you never have figured this yeah. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Simone of the Desert. Yeah, so, yeah Simone of the Desert, great film. Yeah. You know, Simone of the Desert, that's a beautiful film. Well. When, when, you got the, very when the guy holds his hands <laughs> yes. up and yeah. they're... they're um, <laughs> Stored. He didn't have any hands. He just had right. stumps. Right. And the little boy says, "But Daddy, are they the same hands?" Right. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah. He was very much against the. Good. Today's good. It's a little pandemonium. In there. This, this is uh, yeah. What I get for going to that stupid movie. But anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, anyway, um, by the way, in um, in Hegel, there are three. Uh, types of history too. Uh, there's the original history, there's the reflective, and then there and and, and uh, uh, then there's a philosophical history. The reflective is both pragmatic and critical. So you have this 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 group, you know, since Hegel in terms of philosophy of history or thinking through historicity, Hegel being the first, with original, reflective and then philosophical history. And Nietzsche is, you know, obviously going after Hegel in some ways with the antiquarium, the monumental, and the uh, critical uh, in, 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 in many ways. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, look, we need a politics beyond just transfiguration. I mean, that, that's a possibility. You know, we, can, we can transfigure. We know enough about art. We know enough about, you know, changing you know, kind of conditions, you know, into mutation into something, you know, different, right? 
in some ways. However, on the other hand, don't we need something that has substance with it too? You know, what, are, what, what would be the working principles? And maybe we haven't progressed further than Hegel, I mean, or than Plato with uh, the principle of justice. How do you build a new new society without justice and care? I would add this, you know. Heidegger doesn't really speak about justice, you know. He speaks the, about care. Those The strong serve the poor. Not the poor, the weak. Right, so yes, that's the, that course. has to be the built into the yes, of course into yeah, the yeah yeah, you know. yeah, 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 yeah. How do you build? I like when you use the word culture. However, I think culture is derivative from ethos. It's a der derivation. Hmm. So maybe we should begin with this too. I mean, something we can think about. I'm not saying that this is an answer or anything, but maybe it's a starting point to begin with this ethos which has, you know, connotations and, you know, um, to environment, mm -hmm. to how we're thrown, you know, where we are, right, et cetera, as well as ethics, an ethic. How do you develop an ethic for the future? So maybe this is something we can think of, and then the offshoots of that, such as culture. Yeah, yeah. Now, does the ethos come from the aesthetic, where Heidegger goes in the end, the origin of the work of art, right? He critiques the age of the world picture. You know, these are some of the things he does. You know, is it going to begin in the aesthetic realm? You know, in the building? You know, what are you building here, in a sense? Or does it come from the political? Or is the art and the political together, which has always been a problem with artists, right? That the politics have never really been there, right? I mean, they may be implicit in the work, but the artists have never been, quote unquote, the front rank. They may lead the way in terms of the prefiguration of what's to come, but it's never really been a leader, right? You know, in a sense. Yeah. So you have what kind of class are you going to set up in the, in the ethos too? You know, what 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 kind of class would it be? Would it be a class of the most creative, which is what Nietzsche wanted? He wanted the great destroyers are the great creators, right? You have to break the idols. I mean, it's biblical in some senses. You've got to break the old idols in order to create, you know, yeah, the non-idol, new idol, so to speak, right? right, right in some ways. Yeah, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're really kind of exploring today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. I was just thinking, and, you know, there's a, the, I think it's the New York Review of Books just came out with a... Uh, Apparently, there's a new translation of all of Caesar's uh, writings on, on his, his wars. <laughs> and um, right. no, he talk about destroyer. I mean, yes. No, Nietzsche, Nietzsche had great Nietzsche. admiration for Caesar. <laughs> 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 was, As he had for Machiavelli, too. Yeah, but he was really a, a, <laughs> and Borgia. Yeah. quite amazing. He had yes. no, no concerns whatsoever well, for this, boundaries, for, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, for, for anything. But he did. It's an interesting combination. I mean, he had some social yeah. moves, whatever, pragmatic reasons or whatever. He, he created more wealth, increased the welfare, increased yeah, of course. pension yeah. for veterans, did, did yeah. a lot of liberal liberal things. Yes, right. The, the article is called Caesar Bloody Caesar. Oh, I thought it would be had Caesar in the welfare state. Right. Right. I got his, you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he marched across. But you, you you bring up an interesting it just reminded me going back to what Arto was saying why the Greeks for Heidegger and when you bring up Caesar, you know, one way too of looking at this is Nietzsche was really, you know, the choice as you guys probably remember is Rome or Judea, right? For, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for Heidegger, it's, you know, Greek, Athens or Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. And really, before Athens, really, in some ways. So this is one of Chestov's very interesting books, by the way. Who was, um, you know, who Kozhev wrote his uh, dissertation on, by the way. Lev Shestov, a forgotten Russian philosopher, um, you know, wrote a very good book called Athens or Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, Heidegger wants to take the path of Greek. Bean speaks Greek. Nietzsche, you know, in his way, you know, becoming speaks, you know, Latin and forward, right? Mm -hmm. and he, he's very interested in the Imperium Rome. And this is Lukács. 
if you read between the lines in Luca, I don't buy the whole thing, but I think it's a very good essay on Nietzsche in the destruction of reason. It begins to talk about this, uh, uh, you know, in a very interesting way that Nietzsche becomes the last great apologist, the most clever and smartest for the ruling, you know, class. Right, in some ways. So you have to think about this at multiple levels once again. What what is the use? <laughs> value of this, right, at, at one level. I mean, you know, we're really at that point in history where we can't be purists, you know, you know, because, you know, we're going to be going the one godfather of fascism and another godfather <laughs> of fascism if you're going to be totally purists about this. But yeah, what, where, where is the use value in this and what does it help us think and think differently, you know? And what does it lend, if you will, again, to the to the Marxist tradition, to, to you know the heritage that we we have in some ways, you know, and and uh, you know or you know in deeper ways or deeper intensities and, and I mean one cases. mechanical. I mean Marx actually speaks about Greece the same way. Yeah. I mean one. You know this. I mean you know yeah. this in the Grundrisse. You know I began a piece on on this yeah. actually. Uh, you know uh, on <clears throat> this thing, and I wish Neil Larson. I mean, I I think this this in the Grundrisse is one of the starting points for really beginning to reorient Marx along the lines of what Chris, she's in the bathroom, but what she was saying about the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to go back. Why does Marx say we're we're still like children mm -hmm. before the, the 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 production of the Greek statues, the the Parthenon? You know, these works that still bring us amazing childlike. You know joy, if you will, you know? Yeah. Then he goes on to say, you know, uh, the, the Vulcan, I mean, Achilles is no match for the Vulcan uh, yeah. firearms company, or, you know, he goes <laughs> on, so-and-so is not the match for the credit mobilier, you know, and he goes on, uh, this section of the Grundrisse. But it's a very interesting section in so, the introduction sa sa section to the Grundrisse. Can we, like, so, very interesting to my, my mind, vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis. Yeah, I don't can know. Can we yeah, transpose the pair to today, like, quasi-mechanistically, <coughs> you know, Petrograd or Washington or Beijing or Washington, not Washington or something like that. Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, that's that's just to start the it's start a fair the, game the start discussion. the starting point yeah. away from Athens without abandoning Athens, subsuming. I Athens. mean, the, the the problem. Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. when I yeah. when I I mean, it seems to me when he goes back to the Greeks is is what I read it as because they had very broad. Um, kind of ideas of being like very open Absolutely. ideas of being that you can read into yeah. and invent in, uh, into a, into yourself yeah. in a way. And I it's think like it's less about these, power than Nietzsche. It's these kind of broad interesting. categories, these broad concepts. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that Heidegger in some ways is really not about the same level of political power as Nietzsche mm -hmm. is or the will to power. For, for, for Heidegger, the will to power is still a moment of Western metaphysics. You know, and, and keep keep this in. I mean, again, keep this in mind. I'm not saying again. Don't, please don't hear me as this is right or wrong, or you know, the, this kind of. Thing. I'm I'm really trying just to open up what you know what Josh just said. Mm -hmm. You know about that. You know Heidegger has a reason for the Greeks in terms of these broad categories. Yeah, they and, help you us know, think this continent yeah. of mathematics and what was what was going on. And, you know, like it or not, they were you know this this signifier, the Greeks, right, whatever that means, mm -hmm. are the ones that systematized everything. They might have lifted from North Africa, mm -hmm. from India and China, but they're the ones that, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, like I was this. reading yeah. this thing, because yeah. yeah. we did this thing with Rachel, about gender, that they didn't really have an idea of man or woman, but in some sense no. they were already combined. One was yes. inside and one was Absolutely. outside. I mean, Absolutely. that's a beautiful concept. It right? is a beautiful concept. You know, that yeah. I think we could really use. And you I think you that's write kind that of what... in my obituary to all the women that <laughs> felt I betrayed. You know, you know, you know, <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's very beautiful, isn't it? I, I think mean, so. They, yeah. they thought about yeah. this, and you know, you had this in Tiresias in the in the in the in the Greeks who who was both sides, and mm -hmm. you know, and then of course he asked which side had it better. He said, of course, a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, the great blind prophet, the soothsayer, the interpreter. Really, the first interpreter, really, in a sense, was those who divined the signs. The soothsayer, Tiresias in the Greek tragedy. He's a great figure. And he's blind. Right? Well, yeah. he was blind because he had the privilege of being both a man and a woman. And that was 
he, the gods blinded him for that. Well, yeah, Zeus yeah. blinded him. <laughs> if you want to have the best, of, he gave right. the wrong answer to which, which, which is better or which enjoys it. Which yeah, Zeus, Zeus was, we couldn't oh, tell Hera yeah. that <laughs> she would go to town, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's a good point that yeah. this kind of very broad level, in a sense, whereas Imperium Roman for Nietzsche fits more with Nietzsche's, you know, desire in some ways as a political thinker that he's really thinking through power and power relations all the yeah. time, you know, and maybe much more of a, a realist, you know, in this regard. I mean, Heidegger is thinking, and this may be part of, you know, and again, we have to be careful with the word of nostalgia, right? <laughs> but, you know, what, what, what is that nostos about, you know, in some ways, you know? Is it restorative? Is it healing? Is, does it have that force? How is it related then to Zorga, to care, and the call to conscience? You know, so these, these are also very, I think, very good questions uh, going forward. I, again, look, listen, the more I read, and, you know, I, I do read a lot, and maybe probably too much, so I should, you know, uh, put down the books and write more. Go to but, more movies. Yeah, yeah, go to more <laughs> movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, that that the, the, the more I, I, I think about this, uh, again, I think Stiegler, in terms of our times, is raising the most interesting questions, you know, in, in a way, that he is the one that has really thought through you know, he doesn't phrase it. I mean, you have a very yeah, good yeah. idea here, going back yeah. to Becker and the birth of biopolitics. He's well aware of this, but the way he's asking these he's questions, asking the fundamental especially questions, about yeah. memory and yeah. forgottenness, we have forgotten the question of how to remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what we've really forgotten. Yeah, we've forgotten how to remember. Remember. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we should take up techniques in time after this. Yeah. Maybe that would follow. It's After Heidegger, Volume Two, right? The one on memory, the chapter, or is it? <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I got him reading that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, you got a head start. Time, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's he's very important. Yeah, yeah, very important. That would be cool. Um, all right. There go the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great Italian too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I'll, 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 I'll think about. It. I mean, you know, I, I mean, what did we read of Stieglers? We read the book critique on the political critique economy. the political economy, the somewhere, shock and we read the states of shock. States we read shock. the first four or five chapters of that, right, and looked at some of his we propositions oh, yeah, yeah, going that. forward. Okay. He's very good on the Frankfurt School there. And on the lost spirit of capitalism, very good argument mm -hmm. with Marcuse mm -hmm. in terms of eros and civilization. He's, he's a very, you know, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I recommend everybody to spend five years in jail doing philosophy. <laughs> that's that's a in real, a French jail. Yes, a French, French jail. <laughs> French yeah. jail especially, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Crucial. Yeah. yeah. It should be a prerequisite. You don't want to do, do that, that now Danbury. on the forum. <laughs> <laughs> not going to okay. be reading it in Danbury. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I just want to say that Nietzsche, I have a phrase of his that I've, I found you know, when I was thinking about this, that the unhistorical and the historical together are necessary in equal measure for the health of an individual, of a people, or of a culture. So it's both forgetting and remembering that it's always active here, right? In a sense, right? Active right. forgetting. Active forgetting, yeah. yes. Right. Which fits in the yeah. Dasein and it's thrown the, the active striving, mm. right? In some ways. Interesting. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What Heidegger's obviously thought through. Right. These are not small minds, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, not small at but all. But you feel this in the European, like, I was in Bulgaria and the university system there, it's very much like set up in the German sense. And all my the comrades there, like, when they present their lectures, the men, they're like, the minimum is three hours that you have to talk. You know? and, then and then they just start reading and talking, kind of like the these lectures by Adorno and everything is just hours and systematically written and, and if you don't have systematic arguments they just kick you out they're like okay that's enough you're not ready and, you know. <laughs> it's not like I see your point I love your effort you know, <laughs> you know. 
Well, I think last week we read the, the sketch, right? And then we looked at the temptation and tranquilization in everyday life in terms of the being towards death and the idle talk of the, the they and sympathy and all that. I feel your loss, I feel your pain, kind of, you know, nonsense, right, in, in, in a sense. And then, uh, so he, he does this, and uh, also the death is being postponed always to a later date. It's not just deferred action, it's the postponement of death, which is a major difference, I think, between Freud and, and, and uh, Heidegger in terms of therapeutic purposes or a design analysis is always going to look at a postponement of death, whereas in the Freudian activity, the neurosis or the, the lag time is always because of a deferred action, mm -hmm. right? The noctalitite versus that of the postponement of death, right? Yeah, instead of that it's possible at every moment, right? And again, the moment here at the bottom here, you know, the present as moment is where the authenticity is and the disclosedness, right? The, you know, to go back to this. This is on pages 247 and 248, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, when he goes on. Uh, and I wanted to kind of go to being towards death at the, you know, uh, death is grounded in care at the bottom of the page of 248. Um, design is always already delivered over to its death, right? And this again, you know, in terms of this first moment, the striving and, uh, you know, the history. I'm going to try to keep this within both, you know, dying and history, right, to, together, right, uh, you know, for, for Heidegger. Um, being towards its death, it dies factically and constantly as long as it had not yet reached its demise. The design dies factically means at the same time that it is always already decided in this or that way in its being towards death. Every day entangled evasion of death is an inauthentic being towards it. Okay? So the more entanglements you have, you know, everybody tells me I'm busy, you know, when I talk to them. I'm very busy. I'm, you know, I'm too busy, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's entanglements. Yeah. You know, in a way, that's a grand cover-up, if you really think about this, of the being towards death, is that busyness. Yeah. Everybody but Rachel, she's excluded from that. <laughs> because she's, uh, you know, she's works, busy. works the hard, uh, creating all day, yeah, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You should play Money, Money Waters. Now. I started to cry, but the tears won't come down. <laughs> 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 right. I'll put it out yeah. on Monday Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I got my mojo working. Right? Anyway, I'm going to stop. Anyway, okay. So, Dizon diverts itself, and for the most part, it's always diverted itself, Right. Design exists, it determines itself as the kind of being it is, and it does so always in terms of a possibility which itself is and understands. Can Design authentically understand its own most, its non-relation, insuperable, certain possibility, that is, as such, indefinite? That is, can it maintain itself in an authentic, and this is a very good question, can it maintain itself? in an authentic being towards its end. As long as this authentic, page 249, as long as this authentic being towards death has not been set forth and ontologically determined, there is something essentially lacking in our existential interpretation of being towards the end. Authentic being towards death signifies an existential poss existential possibility of Dasein. This ontic potentiality of being must be in turn ontologically possible, right? What are the existential questions of this possibility and how are they to, themselves to become um, accessible? Then he goes on to talk now about the crucial part, the existential, the existential project of an authentic being towards death. I mean, does anyone want to comment on this? It's read it. Uh, any any thoughts? Uh, you know, I mean, I can go. It's the last section of this uh, this uh, 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 chapter that you know we we read supposedly for last week, right? Okay, we'll see you. Be in touch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. This possible being a whole of and the being towards death. So, how can it be characterized objectively? 
And everybody remembers, look, the ontological <coughs> ground, everything is derivative from that. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that we do is derived from that. Right? <coughs> so these are derivative traits that he talks about in, in everydayness for the most part, right? Okay, so please keep that in mind. And that's on the handout I gave you, you know, the early diagram where I had the derivatives and the existentials, right, that are, that are there. All right, so anyway, um, uh, objectively, if in the end uh, Dasein is never authentically related to its end, or if this authentic being must remain concealed from others in accordance with its meaning, is not the project of the existential possibility of such a questionable existential potentiality of being a chimerical undertaking? What is needed for such a project to get beyond a merely poetizing arbitrary construction? Does design itself provide directives for this project? Can the grounds for its phenomenal justification be taken from design itself? And can our analysis of design up to now give us any prescriptions, prescriptions for the ontological task we have now formulated so that what we have before us can be kept on a secure path? The existential concept of death has been established, and thus we have established that to which an authentic being toward the end should be able to relate itself. Furthermore, we also characterized inauthentic being towards death, and thus we have prescribed how authentic being towards death cannot be in a negative way. The existential structure of an authentic being towards death must let itself be projected with these positive and prohibitive instructions. Design is constituted by disclosiveness. Again, I emphasize it's the da capitalized, sign, lowercase, sometimes with a hyphen, we're looking at the there beingness, right, of something always, right? Authentic being towards the, you know, that is by attuned understanding, you know, and as you guys remember, mm -hmm. you know, attunement, understanding and attunement are crucial for this. Authentic being towards death cannot evade, cannot evade its own most non-relational possibility or cover it over in this flight and reinterpret it for the common sense of the they. The existential project of an authentic being towards death must then set forth the factors of such a being which are constitutive for it as an understanding of death in the sense of being towards this possibility without fleeing or covering it over. Okay, so we're, now we're going to go, right, to, to think about this. What does this really mean? First of all, we must characterize being towards death as a being towards a possibility. Right? We're always possibility. Remember the Kantian proposition, possibility is higher than actuality. Right? Always work. Being is not a real predicate, but possibility is always higher in actuality. This is Kant's thesis on being that Heidegger really takes extremely seriously. You know, we are always towards a possibility, that is towards something possible can mean to be out for something possible as taking care of its actualization. So you begin to see the movement of care, possibility taking taking shape here, you know, in terms of a structure. In the fields of things at hand, and objectively present, the, vor, the Zumhanden and the Vorhanden, right, in terms of the ready to hand and the present to hand, we constantly encounter such possibilities. What is attainable? What is manageable, viable, and so forth? Being out for something possible and taking care of it has the tendency of annihilating the possibility of the possible by making it available. The actualization of useful things at hand and taking care of them, producing them, getting them ready, readjusting them, is, however, only relative insofar as even that which has been actualized still has the character of being relevant. Even when actualized as something actual it remains possible for, it is characterized as an in order to. You know, it has purpose, it has means ends. Our present analysis simply make clear how being out for something and taking care of it is related to the possible. 
it it does so it does so not in the thematic and theoretical reflection on the possible as possible, or even in with regard to its possibility as such, but rather in such a way that it circumspectly looks away from the possible to what it is possible for. Okay? All right. So we have a kind of purposeful, right? Now possibility happening. Obviously being towards death now in question cannot have the character of being out for something. You know, you cannot instrumentalize this initially, okay? So the me generation, the me too movement, <laughs> all this meanness out there is not really authentic, you know, encounters with being towards death and not really the possibility in Heidegger's term as the higher than actuality. With a view. For one thing, death is something possible, is not a possible thing at hand or objectively present. So we're taking out any scientism, right? And any instrumentalization here, right? And objectification. But a possibility of being of design. Then, however, taking care of the actualization of what is thus possible would have to, would have to mean bringing about one's own demise, right? Suicide. No. But by doing this, Dazan would deprive itself of the very basis for an existing mm. being towards death. Well, Interesting, huh? Yeah. Great argument, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> you can't do it. Let me get my Heidegger out, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, you're for closing. Su suicide. Yeah. Su yeah. Yeah, you're Su you know, suicide remarks are torn from the fool's gold mouthpiece and the hollow horn. Bob Dylan, very good. You know, he, he didn't read Heidegger but he's coming from the same <laughs> point. You know, I don't think he got Heidegger on the road anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, if being towards death is not meant as an actualization of death, neither can it mean to dwell near the end. Uh -huh. To dwell near the end. This is another great part. Yeah. part, part yeah. This is very beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you see the poetics of Heidegger at work here, you know, really, in a way. All right? This kind of behavior would amount to thinking about death thinking about this possibility and how and when it may be actualized. Brooding over death does not completely take away from it its character of possibility. It is always brooded over as something coming, but we weakened it by calculating how to have death under our control. Mm -hmm. As something possible, death is supposed to show as little as possible of its possibility. On the contrary, if being towards death has to disclose understandably, understanding leap, the possibility which we have characterized as such, then in such being towards death, this possibility must not be weakened, it must be understood as possibility, cultivated as possibility, and endured in, in, in possibility in our relation to it. Yeah, it's a good section. Mm -hmm. It's against, um, what's the word, like uh, certainty. Yes. It's against certainty and it's yeah. against so many statistical yeah. things. Am I supposed to die at 82? Mm. I'm yeah. starting to brood. Stanley always asked me, how old was he when he died? You know? I said, Stanley, why do you ask these questions? Yeah. And it's a very un Heideggerian way of putting things. <laughs> you know, I got yeah. a, yes, sure, I got, I got a thing from my IRA. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear him, right? <laughs> I got a thing from my IRA. I've got 26 and a half years left. They told you that? Yeah. Oh, well, you're in good shape. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're a good man to know from that, that IRA. Stretch yeah. it out. Stretch yeah. it out. Stretch yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have that many. Yeah. Anyway. But I bet you I'm going to outdo yeah. their, their calculations. According, according to Charles Schwab. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. That's where your IRA is. <laughs> is it a Roth? It's yeah. tax free? Uh, it's not a Roth. Oh, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tax free is uh, you know better you know yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean the elders should really should not be paying for this military budget. Yeah. 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 No, I. Yeah. I Ten percent. I love the new Cold War, right? Russia spends you know forty eight million billion, and we spend uh, seven hundred and sixty. We went up ten percent. They went down three percent. But they've started the new arms race. 
Right. Do they have a smart cruise missile that can go over? Yes, the, the drone. Over the drone from yeah. under yeah, yeah. yeah. They got all yeah. these kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Russian science at work using German science. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. So let's let's go on here. This is this is very good. However, design relates to something possible in its possibility by expecting it. Right. This is interesting. This word. Ervarthen. <laughs> Ervarthen. <laughs> I expect it to come. <laughs> Anyone who is intent on something possible may encounter it in, unimpeded and undiminished in it whether it comes or not, or whether it comes at all. You know? But with this phenomena of expecting, has our analysis not reached the same kind of being towards the possible which we already characterized as being out for something and taking care of it? Very good. How it's instrumentalized once again, right? To expect something possible is always to understand and have it with regard to whether and when and how it will really be objectively present. Expecting is not only an occasional looking away from the possible to its possible actualization, but it's essentially a waiting, right? Very nice, waiting for the actualization. If you have an expectation, you're waiting for the actualization. Very well put, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Even in expecting, in one leaps away from the, what's that, I'm sorry? It's the same word in Italian, aspettare. Yeah, it's expect yeah. and to yeah. wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Even in expecting, one leaps away from the possible and gets a footing in the real. It is for this, its reality, that what is expected is expected. By the very nature of expecting, the possible is drawn into the real, arising from it and returning it to it. But being towards this possibility as being towards death should relate itself to death so it reveals itself in this being and for it as possibility. Terminologically, we shall formulate this being towards possibility as anticipation, not expectation. Right? And you begin to see how, you know, he thinks here. The Vorlaufen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You can see they're making fighter jets, Vorlaufen. <laughs> right? Yeah. But does not this mode of behavior contain an approach to the possible? Does not its actualization emerge with the nearness of the possible? In this kind of coming near, however, one does not tend towards making something real available and taking care of it, but as one comes nearer understandingly, the possibility of the possible only becomes greater. The nearest nearness of being towards death is possibility, is as far removed as possible from anything real. The more clearly this possibility is understood, the more purely does understanding penetrate to it as the possibility of the impossibility of existence in general. As possibility, death gives Dasein nothing to be actualized, and nothing which it itself could be as something real. It is the possibility of the impossibility of every mode of behavior toward of every way of existing. In anticipating this possibility, it becomes greater and greater, that is, it reveals it something as something which knows no measure at all, no more or less, but means the possibility of the measurelessness, impossibility of existence. Essentially, this possibility offers no support for becoming an intent on something, for picturing for oneself the actuality that is possible and so sort of forgetting its possibility. As anticipation of possibility, being towards death first makes this possibility possible and sets it free as possibility. So, being towards death defined here is the anticipation of a potentiality of being, of that being whose kind of being is anticipation itself. In the anticipatory revealing of this potentiality of being, design discloses itself, right, to itself, right? with regard to its most extreme possibility. But to project oneself upon one's own most potentiality of being means to be able to understand oneself in the being of the being thus revealed to exist. 
Anticipation shows itself the possibility of understanding of one's own most and extreme potentiality of being, that is, the possibility of authentic existence. Its ontological constitution must be made visible by setting forth the concrete structure of anticipation of death. How is the phenomenal de definition of the structure to be accomplished? Evidently, by defining the characteristics of anticipatory disclosure, which must, which must belong to it, so that it can become the pure understanding of the own most non-relational, insuperable, certain, and as such, indefinite possibility. We must remember that understanding does not primarily mean starting at a meaning, but understanding itself in the potentiality of being that reveals itself in the project, right? This is good, right? You don't come in, you know, it's always pre-understanding, right? Something that happens afterwards, right? It's revealed in the project itself. Mm -hmm. Death is the own most possibility of design. Being toward it discloses to design its own most potentiality of being in which it is concerned about the being of design absolutely. And here it can become evident to design that in the eminent possibility <coughs> of itself, it remains torn away from the they. That is, anticipation can always already have torn itself away from the they. The understanding of this ability, however, first reveals its factical lostness in the everydayness of the they self. <coughs> okay? Now, the onmost possibility is non relational. <laughs> Anticipation lets the design understand that it has to take over solely from itself the potentiality of being in which it is concerned absolutely by its own most being. Death does not just belong in an undifferentiated way, in an undifferentiated way to one's own design, but it lays claim on it as something individual. The non-relational character of death understood in anticipation, individualizes design down to itself. <coughs> Excuse me. The individualizing is in a way, it's a way in which the there is disclosed, right? Is disclosed for existence, the there. It reveals the fact that any being together with what is taken care of and any being with other fails when one's own possibility, almost possibility of being is at stake. Design can <coughs> authentically be itself only when it makes this possible of its own accord. You cannot be told you're authentic, right? You cannot be told from the outside. This is nothing coming from the outside, right? But if taking care and being concerned failed us, this does not, however, mean at all that these modes of design have been taken uh, have been cut off from its authentic being itself, an essential st as essential structure, structures of the constitution of design. They also belong to the condition of the possibility of existence in general. Design is authentically itself only so far as it projects itself as being together with things taken care of and concerned for being with primarily upon its own most potentiality of being rather than upon the possibility of the they self. Right? Anticipation of the non relation of its non relational possibility forces the being that anticipates into the possibility of taking over its own most being from itself of its own accord. So we really need uh, you know the, the individual here in order to have this authenticity or the subjectivity mm -hmm. is, is necessary, right? Always already. One has to extract oneself from the they self or the dictatorship of the they self, if you want to call it that, you know, yeah. You know, on the one hand, the dictatorship of, of the proletariat, right, is kind of interesting in the sense that it is a dictatorship of the proletariat, not by the proletariat. You begin to think about this, what the term really meant, right? In the sense that you needed a vanguard to direct it, right? You needed, a, you know, etc. The dictatorship of the they self is the mass 
dictating to the other. So Heidegger sees this in a very, you know, in a very different light, that the neo, the liberal state, in a way, is a kind of mass psychology of the they self. Mm. Or what Kozhev ultimately would say, America is the most communist society because everything is there. You know, there's an abundance, right? And it fulfills every need. This is what he says. I mean, not that he visited and went, went on a tour with us. You know, this is important. Right. Yeah. Is this, is this the yeah. first the first place? Uh, and I, you know, I haven't written the, the entire work, but uh, where where um, he uses the word individual? Because I can't. I don't remember. Uh, I think word. individuals used in the context, yes, of uh, authenticity and in this section of being towards death. Yeah. And I'm not sure it's used. I mean, if she's using it in translation, I'll have to check it against the. The German, but I'm not. I'm not so sure. I don't, there's, there's a glossary in this one, right? I don't think it's. Yeah, there is. Let me just see something here. Individual and individualizing. Well, he has individualized, to individuate early on, and then he has uh, many, many sections here, yes. Um, you know, I think these are page numbers. Let me just see something. I think he first uses it in the, in the context of, um, of uh, the beginning of part one, yeah, the preparatory analysis, unless that's section 39. There may be section, there may be over about sections. Yeah. I'm not sure, David. I mean, but he does use oh, yeah, it all. Yeah, this is in the... Uh, it, just, it reminded me of um, Margaret Mahler's separation and individuation. Uh, well, she came after him. I think so, yeah. Okay. No, she was okay. well after I did. Yeah, no, right? no, no, but I'm just wondering... This is the Chicago <laughs> School of huh? Psychoanalysis, she, right? Yes. Um, yeah, Margaret Mahler is the, you know, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I a very very significant person. Separation and individuation, <laughs> yeah. right? That right. the child must separate from the mother, yeah. you know, at a certain level and individuate, uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you took some of that from, from, yeah. from, uh, <coughs> from Heidegger. Yeah, I, I, that I don't know. I mean, Freud, Freud talks about separation, you know, often. Separation yeah. anxiety. She's taking up separation anxiety vis-a-vis -vis studies. Yeah, with the, the individuation with the is a separate... Yes, you know, right. So separate everything. Yeah, uh, uh, Nori, what were we going to say? No, no, sorry. I, if you don't... Yeah. Can I introduce one passage that I read from yeah, German, sure, of German course. ideology? Mm. And then I thought oh, yeah, sure, of course. I'd be wanting to share with everyone. Yes, okay, no, no problem at silence. all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, so... This is on the individuals? Yeah, it's, it's more of like the, uh, what it means to be authentic and also being towards that. And I thought there was kinship in the passage that I found in German ideology. Okay, I'm listening, yeah. And Sorry if my pronunciation was not. It's okay. So this is the section where he's criticizing the Max Turner's. Tell me, tell me what uh, section it is. It's in the... It's in book two of the German ideology? No, it's on the book, I think, three, the Saint, Saint Max. Oh, on Saint Max. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, no, I know the section. Okay. <coughs> Sorry if it's... Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. It's just only one show. So the good citizen, Sterner, 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 Sterner yeah. who, is, uh, who is already rejoicing... The Ego in Its Own, by the way, is the name yeah. of the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who is already rejoicing that he will again find his beloved worry in communism, has n nevertheless miscalculated this time. Worry is something but the mood of oppressions and anxiety, mm -hmm. which in the middle class is a necessary companion of labor. Of beggary activity, sorry. Vagaries. Vagary activity yeah, yeah. for the security. Vagary activity for securing mm -hmm. scanty earnings. Worry flushes it, flourishes us mm -hmm. in its purest form among the good German burger. Where it is chronic and always ident identical with itself, miserable and contemplative. Whereas the poverty of the proletariat assumes an acute, sharp form, drives him into the life and death struggle, make him revolutionary. 
and therefore engen engender not worry, but passion. Mm -hmm. Then I thought there was so much kinship with the section that we read. Uh -huh. Like worry of the middle class seems to be this uh, idea of like a fear or fear of death. Whereas the proletariat, he seems to be characterizing that because of the material conditions, it's always already been towards death. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. You could say the worry of the middle class exactly. led, led to fascism yes. in the 1930s. Or, you know, <laughs> I mean, but I, it was basically, you know, a lower, you know, petty bourgeois angst, anxiety to start with. Sorry, I. No, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to think it through here because, I mean, you know, um, uh, the fight to the death. Is already in the Hegel, you know, between lordship and bondage. So it was taken up by the tradition, and especially Kojev and, in, in, um, you know, it was a melange of Heidegger, Marx, and Hegel, um, you know, in terms of in guise or in, in place of an introduction, in the introduction of the reading of Hegel, where he talks about the struggle to the death mm -hmm. of the laborer and the, and, the, and the worker in a certain way. And uh, I don't know if. Um, uh, Heidegger is really developing a, a class here, no, as we, not. as no. we, as we, you know, normally think of class in some ways. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the question in my mind is, is if the laborers really risk risking their lives, why are we in this mess all the time with? Uh, you know, the labor unions. I mean, you know, the best thing that happened this week is this long seven-day wildcat strike in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing, yeah. you know, in many ways, right? No, These people are risking, but at the same time, we're not getting that on a regular, you know, basis. There's a little, no, you know, yeah. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's such a great example because it, it was done completely outside of the unions. Right. Therefore, there was no, nothing that the courts could strike against. No, no leaders that they could put in jail. No unions they could find. Right. Uh, you know, no real leadership that they could, you know, target. Right. right. And it was just uh, spontaneously. And I'm sure it wasn't spontaneous. Wasn't it was spontaneous. organized. But, no, no, no. It, it just happened. Yeah. Lightning strikes twice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it was uh, very cohesive. And however they organized, I'm sure they right. used social media and everything. Right. But the point was there was nothing for the authorities to strike against, to, to, to retaliate. Right, right. Um, and, and, and they said, basically, what are you going to do, throw 336,000 teachers in jail? You know, and there was no answer the, that they could come up with. So, <laughs> we haven't built enough presidents. We would call President yeah. Trump, uh, right. part of the infrastructure, right? Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure they'll figure out a way to, to keep that from happening in other states. But uh. yeah, um, I, I mean, the reason I asked you about, uh, you know, Sterner wrote a book called "The Ego in Its Own," mm -hmm. in which he actually believes in, you know, the kind of he's, he's close to Heidegger in the sense, uh, even though the ego is not, you know, a part of the Heideggerian vocabulary as Dasein instead. But there is ownness there, yeah. you know. And in Marx, Marx is trying to take that apart, you know. So there, there is a difference. I mean, you know, there, there are obviously some similarities which you read, but you know, with Stirner, and Stirner became a kind of uh, uh, person for the anarchists too, you know. Uh, he became a kind of saint in some ways for the anarchist tradition, you know. And um, yeah. Yeah, you know what were you laughing about? No, it's saying just because it's saying for the anarchists. I just thought that was funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, you know, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, yeah, but I mean, the, in the tradition, the real struggle being towards death was really, you know, Kojev who took that up mm -hmm. in terms of his reading of Hegel, you know, where he brings a Heideggerian uh, uh, twist to it. You know, as a Marxist, right? Because the, the the struggle to death was between proletarian and capitalist, or between master and slave in a different way, or capital and wage rape labor relations. You know, and then going back to this whole thing of semiotics and signs and all of that for Lacan, you know, the fourth discourse is all the master discourse is always capitalism. You know, you have the four discourses. You know, you have the discourse of the, of the. Uh, I'm sorry to do this. Uh, 
this, but yeah, kind of important. Uh, um, so you have, in Lacan, you have the, the discourse of, um, of the analysis the patient, right, the neurotic or the psychotic, right? And you have the discourse of the analyst, right? always in translation with this. And then you have the, the discourse of science, right? And the discourse of the university. These are the four discourses in Lacan that are coming you know, through on all, all fronts. Right. And this is the discourse, from his mind, the discourse of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And that the university disseminates, and the hysteric is the knowledge to the analyst. But above all of this is the master discourse, right? Which is always playing out, is master capitalism, the master signifier, right? right? Master discourse is this, right? So, you have the discourse of the master, the master, the master patient, right? And then you have the relationship between techno science, science, etc., and then of course the university. And these relationships are setting up, you know, signifiers and other things all happening in everyday life. This is his play on Heidegger's speech and language mm -hmm. and everydayness, right? And how it works. So you'll, you'll, you know, we talk say in the politics of memory, you know, we'll talk about going to visit, right, the new university, the Technicon in Roosevelt Park, because we're interested in the discourse of techno science and how it's not being articulated in the university or how fragments of it are only being, you know, so we're looking at two of the master discourses. You're also always already talking about the discourse of everything from opioid epidemic to, you know, what's happening on the couch, you know, the couch and culture, uh, you know, and, and also how the analyst is, you know, yeah, doing this. Now, the, the, the analysts themselves, I mean, this is why Lacan was important and, you know, uh, in some ways, is the analyst, psychoanalysis becomes the master of the, of the, the ultimate discourses vis a -vis capital because it's able to translate all of these right into their places and their relationships, right, in a sense. So there's no division, if you will, you know, between anthropology, sociology, <coughs> social work, uh, philosophy, you know, all of these are part of, you know, a, a, a discursive, you know, practices. You know, Foucault takes this up in the archaeology of knowledge, of course. Uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in another way. So very, very important to, you know, kind of keep this in mind. So he's getting a lot of this, you know, Kojev is really talking first and foremost about the, 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 the labor, the proletariat, right? He's really talking about the labor because it's, 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 you know, 1933 in France, it's the Great Depression, right, etc. The proletariat is a crucial figure of agency in the world, and he talks about the struggle of being towards death, but also the struggle to the death between, you know, yeah, the proletariat and the capitalists, right, in, in some ways. Just like in the master-slave colonial discourse, you know, you begin to see this, you know. The great, great film on this kind of struggle, in my opinion, is Burn by uh, Gilo Pantacorvo. It's a great film because it's dialectically constructed about the master discourse, the revolution is usually from without. It doesn't start, you know, revolution is basically a construction of the ruling class, right? Now, what somebody does with it is another story. And this is a very Hegelian constructed film. You know, where you're unfolding scene by scene. You should see it. It's a very beautiful illustration of the dialectic of master slave. Yeah? I, yeah, I think I have the DVD. It also has a sense of repetition in the sense yes. that the island is called Quemada. Burn. Burned. Yeah. And in the in the course of the movie they burn it again. Right. Mm -hmm. 
having been, Burn. preserving it, but at the same time destroying it so you can go into the future. Right? Yeah, burn. Guayamada yeah. is the uh, the term that's used. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm I'm sorry to riff. I mean, you know, Max Stirner again was you know a thinker. That's the second part of the German ideology that very few people read on Bruno Bauer and uh, Max Stirner. Most people concentrate on the first part of the German ideology. Sorry you know. to bring this up, but no, it's okay. Without, no, it's interesting. I probably wouldn't have paid attention to the passage. So that's yeah, no, no, it's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank yeah. You. He yeah. calls it the Saint Max. He wants to put them back in the church. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, not, it's, not, it's not an atheistic Christian. It's a critical, you know, mind. Thanks, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go look at that past. I mean, I have the, the three volumes. You know, when the, the truncated versions used to come out, they did not have a parts two and three of the German oh, ideology. Just the Fuhrbach. Just the Fuhrbach, right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. historical materialism. That's where historical materialism is built, is in the German ideology. That's where it's constructed as a thing. Okay? So anyway, yeah. Uh, I mean, but this is kind of important vis-a-vis -vis what we're talking about mm -hmm. in some ways. In, in, in Heidegger, you know, it's really these, these, this language, right, is the house of being that one appropriates an authentic, you know, in Lacanian terms, full speech is authenticity. You know, you're fully behind your words. You know, most people say, I'm, I'm going to invite you over. They don't mean it. They're just being pleasant or we, are, we really got to get together and all of this, mm. <laughs> you know, etc. But, you know, someone says they're going to do something that they don't do. You know, it's basically owning one's word speech mm. is also going on in this authenticity. Mm. And this is the connection of, you know, Arto's not here, but anyone, the one who acts, the one who thrives, and the one who uses language, right? Yeah, yeah, in many ways. So, yeah. so he's also, you know, speaking at this level, too. Yeah. So, okay. All right, we'll go through this a little more. Um, yeah, because he does use discourse in, in here quite a bit, but it's actually kind of a, I didn't get a clear sense of what discourse was in Heidegger and being in time, actually. Well, I mean, it's, it's good to maybe evoke the later Heidegger in some ways. And, and you know, if you want to read, reread the section, I mean, it will help you with this, is the section that's going on in, um, in um, uh, I think it's chapter four. Um, you know, the sections on understanding, beginning mm -hmm. with understanding and interpretation. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, uh, you go further into Design and Discourse on page 155, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the well, idle talk section, Curiosity, Ambiguity, and then Falling Prey. So this is, again, a very crucial section. Yeah. But Design and we'll Discourse is interesting, you know? Because we're talking about sense, right, in the multiple ways, you know, as, as sense, mm -hmm. right, as meaning, as direction. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about you know, discourse as full or empty speech, right. as the uh, psychoanalysis uh, yeah. takes it up, and also one can think of the, you know, is there a full speech act, mm -hmm. right, in some ways, you know, to, to, ask this, to ask this question, am I really behind that, yeah. you know, and then of course is there anything fully there present, and then dramatically, where are we when we speak, are we speaking? present tense, are we speaking past tense, mm -hmm. what does that really mean, and what are we shaping towards the, the, the future, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so this is all, That's all true. very important. To, we did uh, do that for a while, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, um, just a little more, then I'll, I'll, I'll let us, you know, finish up, and then we'll, we'll do care and sum it up in two weeks, so. Uh, um, all right, let me just, um, Language. um, the difficult chapter. What's that? I'm sorry? That's a, that's a, that was a hard section. What, the discourse? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And language. Well, that's another thing too, curiosity. you know, vis-a-vis -vis the art world again, yeah. you know, does mm -hmm. art really just make statements now or is it subversive? Mm -hmm. And this is a real question going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you see, are you being subverted in the art world now, or you are you just receiving statements? 
Yeah. And what, 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 what is that function, you know, again, politically, you know, in, in, in this context, right? Definitely. And, and I think what happened was is that around 1970 or something, that art took on the role of political statement, you know, and this was a, a problem, <laughs> you know, in some ways, because then it can be read only as statement and not anything, you know, beyond that. You say you just just as the political and not the not the art part in a way. Is what you're yeah, in in yeah. some ways, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And also the subtleties and the nuances, Definitely. you know, being taken out, right, right. Okay, so um, you know, death is the own most possibility. Page two fifty two. Just a couple of highlights here, and then we'll we'll go on. Um, and then uh, um, you know, um, he he speaks about understanding, anticipating, project itself into a definite potentiality of being. Um, and uh, this is on uh, page 254, the, uh, um, you know, the, the lack of certainty before being towards death. And page, page 255, very important, what is characteristic about authentic existentially projected being toward death can be summarized as follows. This is, this is crucial. You really want one section on authenticity. This is it. Anticipation reveals to design its lostness in the they self. How much you've fallen prey or you're dominated by the, the they self. And brings it face to face with the possibility to be itself. Primarily unsupported by concern, top of the page. Yeah. The, by concern that takes care, but to be itself and passionate anxious freedom towards death, which is free of the illusions of the they, factical and certain of itself. Okay? This is, this is his working definition, if you will, hmm. for an authentic, existentially projected being towards death. <laughs> right? This is it, the test, right? All relations, yeah, okay. Give Jennifer my best. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Here's my, uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, okay, great. Enjoy okay, thank Montreal. you. Have a good thank time. you. Yeah, I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. I will okay, enjoy Montreal. You. I'm looking looking forward to it very much. Right, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let us know about the movie. Shoot, shoot us an email if it's worth the uh, I want uh, to see Mark yeah. Atlas. Yeah, he's a great figure. Yeah, I hope they show it again, but uh, Yeah. Anyway, my friend wanted to wasn't into that, so. <laughs> Not into Gregory Markopoulos, well, yeah. It's an avant-garde artist, yeah, and, and Greek yeah. on top of it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I don't know about him either, so no? I can't okay. say anything, but. Uh, um, I have an interview with him, by the way, in an old film uh, uh, comment book uh, with Markopoulos and Rossellini in the same issue. Uh, I bought it just for that reason many years ago, uh, okay. yeah. 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 Oh, it's not. It's not something you did. Is it? No, I didn't do. No, no. I wish I. No, no. I never yeah. knew Mark Copeland. Okay. Yeah, I met Jonas Mikas, but I've never met. Yeah, uh, yeah Mark right. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay thank bye. You. Okay. So anyway, you can see here. This is a very good definition of an anticipatory resoluteness, right? Mm-hmm. Where you free yourself, mm-hmm. if you will, from from the dictatorship of the they, the hum the mass psychology, all of these things, the techniques of servitude, they all break, right? Mm-hmm. Collapse, right? You, you know, breaking, this is really breaking chains in a certain way of, uh, you know, servitude, if you will. And my, my, my understanding here, yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways, right? So all relations belong, and then also, I think another thing here, going back to discourse, I think this also helps in terms of being able to sift through what is actually journalism, mm-hmm. reportage, versus that of, you know, what is very real, right? Uh, what is part of the discourse of the real, right? Yeah, and many, many ways. Okay, so all relations belonging to being towards death up to the complete content of the most extreme possibility of Dazan gather themselves together and this gathering together is also part of the wholeness. He chooses his words wisely, right? Together to reveal, to unfold and hold fast the anticipation they constitute and makes this possibility possible. The existential project in which anticipation has been delimited has made visible 
the ontological possibility, right, of an authentic, uh, existential authentic being towards death, an existential. So you can see he works. Remember, he works on the existential level structurally first, and then he'll go to the ontological level. So you have what, what, what one could call at least preliminary, you know, the existential ontological structure of what it means to be, quote, authentic. Right? Okay. Of course, you know, uh, but with this, anyway, the possibility then appears of an authentic potentiality for being whole, but only as an ontological possibility. Of course, our existential project of anticipation stayed with those structures of design gained earlier and let design itself, so to speak, project itself into this possibility without proffering to design the content of an ideal of existence forced on it from the outside. And yet this existentially possible being towards death remains, after all, existentially a fantastical demand. The ontological possibility of an authentic possibility for being a whole of design means nothing as long as the corresponding ontic potentiality of being has not been shown in terms of design itself. Again, back to the average everydayness, which is your starting point. You're always at the starting point of the average everydayness of the design. You always have to keep that in mind, right? Does design ever project itself factically into such a being towards death? Does it demand, even on the basis of its own most being, an authentic potentiality of being, which is determined by anticipation, right? Before answering, we must investigate to what extent does Zazine bear witness to a possible authenticity of its existence from its own most potentiality of being in such a way that it not only makes this known as existentially possible, but demands it of itself. The questioning hovering over us of an authentic wholeness of Zazine and its existential constitution can be placed on a viable, phenomenal basis only if the question can hold fast to a possibility, excuse me, of a possible authenticity of its being attested by Dasein itself. If we would discuss, succeed in discovering phenomenologically such an attestation and what is attested to in it, the problem arises again of whether the anticipation of death projected up to now only in its ontological possibility as an essential connection with that authentic potentiality of being attested to. Okay? So he's now going to have to go on to the problem of an authentic existential possibility, and this is where the resolutionist comes through. You know, this is where conscience and the resolution comes through. How we are, you know, basically summoned, right? The character of conscience as a call. Right? Uh, okay, so, you know, Zorga is care with conscience, right? The, the conscience calls the conscience, right? Right? So, this is very much like the religious calling, too, you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, you know, I have to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is talked about in the discourse, it's pretty funny what is summoned, section 56, about the summoning and then the call of care 57. So I won't go over that too much. We can, we can do that, uh, uh, you know, next time. Um, but let me, let me just mention a couple of other things here in terms of this, uh, this text. Um, so I said to read, you know, all of, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, Chapter um, uh, three, right? So we we uh, um, because this is where he'll begin to look at. And I don't know. Do you have time to do that, or is it? Uh, yeah, the you read it. You did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what what uh, you know, any thoughts about this in, in chapter three? Because this is a a kind of movement towards. You know the hermeneutical circuit circle, yeah. and uh, where we enter it, right? Yeah, that so, was great. I mean, we can pick this up next time. But yeah, what, what did you think of it? Just for we'll, uh, we'll spend it. I really like this uh, hour. Okay. Do violence 
<laughs> I got really excited about the do violence. I feel like that was something I always heard. Philosophy does violence, you know? Constantly. And, uh, that, and I didn't ever know where it came from. Philosophy should be terrorist activity. <laughs> is this where it comes from? Life, the yes. do violence? Or is it, is it, is he sort of just playing on the do what violence? What page are you on? Let me just see it with the context. <laughs> um, let's see, where is the do violence? Oh, it's, it's in, I think, hold on. Uh, 2.98. <laughs> I jumped ahead a couple seconds. That's all right. Sorry. No, no, it's a good point in place. The hermeneutical <laughs> situation is very important. Yeah. yeah, and it's this third, or I guess it'd be, uh, the, thus the kind of being of Dasein. It starts there. The existential analytic constantly has the character of doing violence, whether for the claims of the everyday interpretation or for its complacency and its tranquilized obviousness. Mm -hmm. Right? So in both times you have an active and a passive violence working here. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, right? Right? Yeah. It's very good, right? Because the kind of being design requires of an ontological interpretation that is set its goal the primordiality of the phenomenal demonstration that has overcome the being of this being in spite of this being's own tendency to cover things over. This is a real politics of uncovering and also con confrontation, right? Mm -hmm. Fronting around, right, this design's tranquilness, where they are, you know, etc. So it's a kind of almost an encampment or an encirclement of the, you know, inauthentic falling prey on the one hand, and then also the authentic you know, doing violence that is required too, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Of the, you know, everyday uh, claims towards authenticity too, right? Together, right? So this is a very, very, very good section. You have the active violence, act of violence. Mm -hmm. It can be passive or active, right, in some ways. You're basically looking at the passive violence of this tranquilization, this everydayness, this immersedness of being in the uh, in the they self, then on the other hand, having the active violence, which is really in a way, you know, to conceptualize, to be decisive, is a kind of cut of violence. Yeah. Resoluteness is an act of violence too, yeah. in yeah. some ways, you know. Yeah. So he's going against, you know, the whole notion of the suicidal or the, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, the tranquilization here. So always think of this as an awakening, too, that he's always trying to play with this. The call of care, the call of conscience, is also an awakening that's <coughs> happening, right? It's a bringing to awareness at another level. On the, on the consciousness level, it's a bringing of the awareness, but in the more internal way, it's a call from within. You know, you've fallen prey again, don't do that, right, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. All right. Um, and then, um, yeah. Um, then it goes on to the. You want to you want to take this up some more? The violence of the project. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. The violent, look at page 299, I think this is crucial too, you hit on a good section. The violent presentation of possibilities of existence may be required for our method, but can it escape being merely arbitrary? <laughs> if our analytic takes anticipatory resoluteness as its basis, as an existentially authentic potentiality of being, and if design itself summons this possibility right out of the ground of his existence, is the possibility then an arbitrary one? Is the mode of being in accordance with which the potentiality of being of design relates to its eminent possibility, death, picked up by chance? Does being in the world have a higher instance of the potentiality of being than its own death? They ask this question, right? right? The ontic and ontological project of design upon an authentic potentiality of being a whole may not be arbitrary, but is the existential interpretation of these fine founding phenomena, excuse me, already justified? 
right? So go. If we say Dasein falls prey, and that the authenticity is to be wrested from this tendency of being, right? From what perspective are we speaking here? Is not everything illuminated by the light of the presupposed idea of existence, even if rather dimly? Where does this idea get its justification? Has our initial project, in which we called attention to, led us nowhere, right? But by no means, we don't. If you think about this in a sense that the author, the restedness from the tendency of being, the falling prey, you look at someone like the writing of Naked Lunch you mm -hmm. know, by Burroughs. You know, that's a, a real example here of someone that would not fall prey anymore and is able to turn that round into an authentic work of art, right? Yeah, yeah, in many ways. Or Genet writing Thief's Journal on a piece of pieces of toilet paper while in prison, right? In a sense, yeah, yeah. French prison system, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot going okay. on in those French prisons. Yes, there are. You know, no question about it. Right? Yeah, they still breed uh, militants, and uh, yeah, <laughs> not like here. We, we breed religious uh, figures, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Some they breed, they breed religious militants too. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Okay. So then the circle on page the chain charge of circularity from yeah, a beam cool. right yeah. on page three oh one is the yeah. circle. You wanna yeah, go ahead, talk about it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I what I liked about that section is like on this, the second part where he says, um, uh, not too much but too little is presupposed for the ontology of Dasein. If one starts out with a wordless I in the order in order, then to provide that I that eye with an object and an, ontolo an ontologically groundless relation to that object, our view is too short-sighted if we make the life a problem and then occasionally take death into account too. The thematic obligation is artificially and dogmatically cut out if one limits oneself initially to a theoretical subject in order to then complement it on the practical side with an additional ethic. So I think it was like a really powerful uh, uh, kind of idea about having, you know, um, presuppositions in a way and, and, right. and bringing right. them into philosophy instead of cutting them out as, as we always do, I guess. Yeah. Right, right. That yeah. was really nice. <laughs> but. Right. No, it's good. No, <laughs> and, 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 and you Heidegger, know, the Heidegger's the first to circle. admit, yeah, yeah. first mm -hmm. to admit that the hermeneutical circle is a presupposition. Mm -hmm. He's the first to admit that philosophy has its comprehensive, you know, uh, a, a moment that it grasps the presupposition. How is the concept formed? Right. And this is very radical yeah. once you really think about this. It really begins to say, how is this begriff in this concept formation, and then how does it become legitimated? Mm -hmm. What is the theoretical, you know, justifiable or juridical act that exactly, makes yeah. the theory the theory? Right. This is very subvert. I mean, you know, very good in, in my opinion. This yeah, this so. opens up all kinds of stuff. You know, you know. You can take down the entire testing industry with this kind of stuff. For sure. Easily. Any day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a lot of philosophy in general, too. Well, oh, yeah. So a lot of the <laughs> philosophy out there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think that's right. a pretty powerful statement. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, there is this thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm also listening. Thing and he also, again, you know, this whole presuppositions is before theory and practice. Mm -hmm. You know, remember that, right? <laughs> that that dichotomy or even that unity in some ways mm -hmm. is also being thrown into question. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at a pre-conceptual, pre-theoretical, pre-scientific, you know, level when we begin to talk about presuppositions, but that philosophy has got to grasp what is that presupposition already, yeah. that is going on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what it's really about. Yeah. Yeah. So philosophy for Heidegger, unlike Deleuze and Guattari, is not only the invention of concepts, it's the conditions under which those concepts were, mm. you know, born. That's interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's even a more radical step back. We'll, we'll talk more about the step back next, next time. That's interesting. Yeah. Distance, you know, distantiation. And Heidegger, very important too, mm -hmm. where you do this. So, you know, I talked a little bit about this when we were still at, uh, you know, Broadway, I think, the step back. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I did some stuff on the board 
on that. But you know, the step back is very important in terms of distanciation, and also when, uh, and also with the circle here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, what else? I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, there was a section that I really liked in uh, Lefebvre's dialectical materialism. Oh, okay. Where he writes about breaking the vicious cycles or circles of uh -huh. thought right. with, I guess, praxis or practice. Right. And I thought that was an interesting kind of parallel to what Heidegger is writing here, um, uh, kind of in this avoiding the circle. You know, people who avoid the circle, believing that it does justice to the loftiest rigor of scientific investigation, is nothing less than the basic structure of care. It's kind of in the middle of the page there, okay, just talking about a circle and avoiding the circle. You know, just there was something to that. Three hundred one. Yeah, three hundred one. Yeah. I mean, this this is a very good description of what he's up to in, in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. um, um, what does presupposing mean? Top of three hundred one. In positing the idea of existence, and remember, you're positing, right? You're going out. Mm -hmm. It begins a position ultimately. Do we also posit some proposition? from which we can deduce further propositions about the being of design according to the formal rules of consistency. Or, and it's important, does this presupposing have the character of a projecting that understands in such a way that the interpretation from which this understanding of form lets what is to be interpreted be put in words for the first time? so that it may decide of its own accord whether, as this being, it will provide the constitution of being for which it has been disclosed in the projection with regard to the formal indication. Is there any other way that beings can put themselves into worlds with regard to their being at all? A circle in the proof cannot be avoided in the existential analytic because that analytic is not proving anything according to the rules of logic of consequence at all. What common sense wishes to get rid of by avoiding the circle, believing that it does justice to the loftiest rigor of scientific investigation, is nothing less than the basic structure of care. Right? Design is always primordially constituted by care. Design is always already ahead of itself. Right? Existing, it has already always already projected itself upon the definite possibilities of its existence. And in these existential projects that is projected pre-ontologically, something like existence and being. But can one deny the projecting of that research essential to design, which, like all research itself, is a kind of being of disclosive design, right? That wants to develop and conceptualize the understanding of being belonging to design. Yeah? Very important here. But the charge of, it comes, of circularity comes from a kind of being of design. Something like projecting, especially ontological projection, necessarily remains foreign to the con common sense, or for the common sense, of our heedful absorption in the they, because common sense variegates itself against it in principle, whether theoretical or practically, common sense only takes care of beings that are in view of its circumspection. What is distinctive about common sense is that it believes it, that it experiences only factual beings, begin, beings in order to be able to rid itself of its understanding of being. It fails to recognize that being can be factually experienced only when being has all, all, all already been understood, even if this understanding is not conceptualized. Common sense misunderstands understanding, and for this reason it must also necessarily proclaim as violent anything lying outside the scope of its understanding as well as any move in that direction. So the violence operates on multiple, multiple levels here, yeah. right? Right? 
mostly against the common sense, like against yes, the right, dayness, absolutely. essentially. Right, right. You have to do violence against the dayness yes, to yes, get beyond. That's correct, yeah. right, right. Okay. And the dayness is the production of the common sense, too. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Very much like in Gramsci, where common yeah. sense is the establishment of norms mm -hmm. and, you know, it basically becomes a logic of conformity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the biggest enemy, is the right. conformity, you know, that's out there. That's what he's really arguing against, you know, in so many ways is that the mass psychology of the they self is going to be conformist, right? You'll see the conformity at the Oscars. And it is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. So. In so many ways. Good. All right. So some other stuff in this? Or, you know, uh, yeah, 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 please. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I, I, I probably need to read this section again. To read. Yeah, no, it's okay. Couple, it's a great couple, section. Yeah, no, this sentence. is a very important section. Uh, yeah. One sentence that I just... My, and what my, page would that it's be? Three or eight. Oh, okay, I later on. Okay, this is from the chapter outside the section now. Yeah. Oh, it is outside the section. No, no, it's in the section. I'm <laughs> sorry, it's in section sixty-four. Yeah. It's uh, so second paragraph. Yeah. I, I'm sure we already covered this in the seminar, but I just wanted to. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Design is authentically itself in a mode of primordial individuation of reticent resoluteness that expects anxiety of itself. So the, the next sentence was, to me, was very crucial. <laughs> in keeping silent, but authentic being a self does not keep on saying I, but rather is in reticence, the throne being that it can be authentically yes. being. Right. Then That's I thought... It's very, very oriental, right? <laughs> 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 well, but right. It is. I mean, yeah. in a way, it's outside of the Western tradition of the subject-object and, hmm. you know, in the domination of the subject over the object. Mm -hmm. You know, the abecchio, you're not throwing yourself against it. It's against dominative, you know, uh, uh, the logic of domination. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many good things here. I mean, you know, you're right. It's a good passage. But go ahead. What, what are we going to say about it? I mean, oh, so sorry. In the keeping with an I, but rather is in reticence, how do you... Uh, how Just do you, is. Just is. Just is. Okay. <laughs> Stay with the is. It's a little word, but for Heidegger, very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. The is and the there is a very good, you know, yeah, combination to think in, in terms of the objects in the world and how they're being constituted, and then your relations, and then your non-relational aspects to it. Right? Right? I mean, he's good here because the self, like he says, right, does not keep on, but rather is in resonance, the throne being that can be authentically be. The self that is revealed by the retins of our resolute existence is the primordial phenomenal basis for the question of the being of the I. Only if we are phenomenally oriented towards the meaning of being, of the authentic potentiality of being a self, are we put in a position to discuss what ontological justification there is for treating substantiality, simplicity, and personalities as characteristics of selfhood. The ontological question of the being of self must be extricated from the forehaving constantly suggested by the predominant way of saying I of a persistently, objectively present self thing. Okay? Hmm. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. On the page before, he, I thought, was interesting as well when he says one is after all what one takes care of in terms of on 307 one is. in the last paragraph um, one is after all what one takes care of oh yeah true oh yeah So, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the eye, and, and may, maybe we can leave this, I can maybe diagram this uh, next time a little bit. Um, you know, Kant says the eye, the ego, if you will, 
is the, the it accompanies all its um, representations. The eye that thinks accompanies all its representations. For Heidegger, this still remains trapped in relational and in, in representational thinking, right? That this is an eye that has not gone beyond that, you know. And remember, part of the the goal, if you will, or intention of this philosophical study, you know, and and treatise is to get outside of representational mm -hmm. thinking. So that's why he's going through this so carefully. And he's trying to ground the eye, not in thinking of representations, but in a way, the design of care. Care as its structure, as its background, right? Yeah. And you're doing violence to thing if you're not taking care. Mm -hmm. The violence is, again, based on the Cartesian logic of a dominion over nature, mm -hmm. you know, the subject dominating the object, uh, Etc. So this is what he's trying to undo in the name of a structure of care, mm -hmm. of Zorga, mm -hmm. which has multiple levels, right? As we talked about earlier, you know, the care as, you know, not only taking care of or concern, but care itself, right, as, as, as a structure, you know, and a call of conscience. So in some ways, this is a, a very open-ended, you know, attempt to dismantle the ego in its own, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you were reading from Sterner earlier, it's not Sterner as the antagonist, it's obviously still the Cartesian logic and the Kantian logic that follows from the Cartesian yeah. logic because mm -hmm. Kant, you know, is still asking the question of the thing, whereas for Heidegger, you know, this is not the way the question has to be posed anymore, right? So he's trying to think outside of this. Mm -hmm. so, so he's doing violence to the tradition that has already done the violence, right? So you have this kind of movement, dual movement of violence that is acting upon the tra tradition and trying to violently wrest it and pull it outside and at the same time is staying within it, right, to work it through, to show it. So this whole section on Kant is a working through of the eye as representational thinking, right? Which is what science does. Science is about representational thinking. It's not about thinking, right? And it's not about, you know, yeah, <laughs> care, care, right? It's not about design, right, in, in, this, in this sense. Uh, so anyway, we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the unit, you know, because he's, he's playing on the word unity here. You know, he's working through this unity of the structural whole, right, and how this I works in the history of philosophy. And this is going on in section 64. That's why I said you were in a different section where you started to read from Nori on page 307. This is in the section called Care and Selfhood, right? Okay, so, you know, this is the working through of the eye, you know, as a, you know, yeah. Maybe we can, oh well. Yeah, what, well, no, I'm listening, yeah, it's okay. I was gonna say, maybe no, no, no problem, what, what's up? Tell me. I was Sorry. just like, well, maybe we could wait to do this section because it seems good, but we're not meeting again. <laughs> we are in two weeks. Right. We are meeting in two yeah. weeks. It gives you a lot of time to think about the eye. <laughs> I guess we could. Yeah. All your representations. Like a very good As you section. walk down the street, I yeah. think accompanying all my representations. Like this is really important. It's a very important section. I, I yeah. Bear consciousness. Yeah. Karen Selfhood. Section 63 and 64 are the two of the most important things. On the circle, anticipatory uh, resoluteness, mm -hmm. and then care and selfhood. Right? Yeah. This is very important to the, the book. Yeah. I thought 65 was, sorry, I didn't know. No, it's that. okay. Uh, no, it's all right. 65 yeah. was also good in terms of really getting to know the exact definition of what temporality is. Yes. Mm -hmm. so yes. Just he goes through the ecstasies. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Also this is on page 314, 315, 316, all of that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, didn't mean. And then how you, how you go back to asking the question again before you get into temporality yes. and everydayness, then temporal. You see how he works, though? You be, I'll, I'll be getting a sense. I mean, there is a, obviously a pattern here in how he works, you know. He'll always start with the existential structure of something. Then he'll try to move to the ontological structure. Mm -hmm. Then he'll try to set this within temporality, right? Mm -hmm. And he'll go through this on every level from design and its average everydayness to its authenticity, then ultimately what does this mean for historicality versus yeah. that of just history, right? He'll ask this question in the 
you know, the being and history section, and then ultimately, what is time? You know, and how is this notion of temporality, which what being really is, being has time, is, you know, in the sense, versus, you know, the, the now of the Hegelian repeating the Aristotelian, you know, he has these patterns, you know, Hegelian view of history, the Hegelian castrated God, you know, this dialogue with Nietzsche happening all the time, right? How the Hegelian now time is not enough, right? It's still seeped in the tradition. And how do we think outside of this? What is the ecstasies as a new moment of time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's setting up very nicely here if you begin to see the, you know, the, the movement of the text. So sometimes it's good, listen, just a little hint to go back to the table of contents and kind of try to remember yeah. what was in it and see it kind of <laughs> unfolding as as, as, it, as, it, as it's working itself out. And yeah, I thought the ways. reading, the last section that you instructed us to do, like the last section of our uh, was yes. I thought was very good cause, because I know the end goal. Yes. So I can see that this yes. is actually a process leading yeah. up to it. And yes. I never read the book that way. Yes, so uh, thank you. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> we, we call that the teleological <laughs> theory of a reading. Begin at the end because you know you're gonna you know find out if the project is fulfilled, yeah. right? In mm -hmm. a certain way, yeah. It is the horizon of temporality. I mean, I don't know how you think about yourself, but you know if you begin to think in terms of self or authenticity vis-a-vis -vis temporality, you're on to something. You're on to something differently. Mm -hmm. You don't waste as much time. You know you don't you don't you you begin to see things in a very different different light, you know? I mean, it's also about clearing here, too. I mean, I'll talk more about that next week. You know, Heidegger is really trying to look at where do we get the clearing, you know, to this otherwise thinking? What, what path is being cleared here? What is, being, what is happening here in, in terms of a new, new, new path to take? You know, how, how will this emerge? Where is the lighting in the clearing, the lichtung? But how do we get to that clearing, you know, et cetera? You know, so this is the one question he's asked his whole life. You know, what does it mean to be and, you know, the question of being. This is his question, really. The meaning, the, forget, the forgetting first, <laughs> then the, the meaning, and then what is the path towards this. And the path is part of the prescription. Not that it works completely, but it's beginning of the prescription. Mm -hmm. You know, because what you're getting is descriptive structures in everydayness. Dasein begins as descriptive features of everyday life, you know. And people like Henri Lefebvre take this up, which is worth reading, Everyday Life in the Modern World, and his three other volumes, you know, on the Everyday Life series is very much out of this, mm -hmm. right? But it's more sophisticated in some ways because he's only going to concentrate on that. He's not interested in whether Bergson has a, a, a valuable, I mean, a, a valid sense of time and space, right? Merging together. This is not, you know, Lefebvre's not asking those kind of questions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, 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 a, he's an anti atheistic Christian Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah. Where'd you get that from? I'm just curious. Marx. What? Marx is an atheistic Christian. Oh, I made that up. I, 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 that's what I'm asking. Where'd you get it from? That I didn't was ask a you who you got it from. Zizak. Oh, I see. When he said he was an, uh, a Christian atheist, I said, so is Marx. But you know, it was interesting because when I was reading the Jewish questions, there was one sentence that Marx said. To be a real, to if you have the true Christian world, Christian world, it will be atheist world. And I didn't really know what that really means, but I thought maybe Zizek took that idea from it. Well, isn't Zizek right about love too? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that like or, a Christian yeah. thing? He writes about love. Mm -hmm. I thought that was like a whole Christian philosophy, love, this love stuff. I don't know. I don't, well, the, the, if you want to, I mean, if you want to delve deeper into that one, um, there's a, the, 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 the fundamental text uh, is the um, St. Paul, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Baju, Zizek, and Agamben all get into it about St. Paul. Mm-hmm. And, you know, actually that was Pasolini to be Pasolini's last film. Really? Is yeah. on St. Paul. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and um, so anyway, there's a lot to be said there. Mm-hmm. What Nietzsche means to me is that the last Christian died on the cross is true. The movement started with St. Paul. And it was a band of outlaws and criminals. That's mm-hmm. that's what he's really speaking to, mm-hmm. and how it became a political movement that basically was based on the politics of Rosentimon. Mm-hmm. This is what he's seen. The Rosentimon was towards the aristocratic class, not the kind of nonsense that we have today. I mean, it's good to be angry and uh, resentful of these people, but in, in a sense, the Rosentimon was against an evaluation, mm-hmm. you know, aristocratic valuation. The fight was always against mediocrity, you know, um, inertia. You know, these, these are the kind of things that are really being fought against. The aristocratic valuation, the system of valuation, you know. In, in, in I was life. just comparing that to no. Marx. No, I understand. And, and that, yeah. you know, yeah. is a completely different point of view. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it is. I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, basically socialism is just, uh, you know, this is Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. Socialism is Christianity, mm-hmm. warmed over. That's all for the, for the new era. Well, you, you know? could say that the worker has resentment for the capitalist. Well, that's uh, all they said in France. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they did. There's a whole tendency, 19 after 68. The, the, the tendency was to, you know, frame it that way, yes, yeah. But you can't say the resentment there is not, you know, see, there's a big difference here. Nietzsche would admire, uh, uh, you know, someone like, um, um, what was his name, uh, oh God, uh, Ouvernier, Pierre Ouvernier at the Renault factory, who's leading groups in capital and ultimately is assassinated because he's really trying to overcome Right? What's going on? Heidegger would have respect for that too. This is not this is not something, you know, when you begin to talk about valuation, right? And you look at say, again, this is why it's good to have principle, you know, at at work, because you say, is is proletarian justice really the goal, right? In a way. You know, what does that mean? Proletarian justice. You know, to me, I have the black book. It's very filled. Well, Arto and I were talking before you came today. The black, Sean was here. I keep the black book, you know, with Heidegger's. people's names. No, no, my own black book. <laughs> that has names. I have names in my black book. Am I in it? No, no, no. You're in the red book, Chris. You're in the red book. <laughs> you're in the red book. No. I say, no, you're in the red book. I'm in the red book. The red book okay. is the best I'm book. I'm destined to be a devil's advocate. I don't know. It's my attunement. <laughs> good, good. It's okay to be the devil's um, advocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no problem with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 His name brings me bringer of light, you know. What? Lucifer. Really? Yes. The bringer of light. <laughs> Did you take, sorry, did yeah. you take the name Situations from Heidegger? No, actually Situations uh, came out of um, um, a, a combination of many things. Mm. One, uh, the Situationists, yeah. Sartre's Situations, the writing of the situational uh, writing, etc. Yeah, that, that's where it really I came see. from. But. But situation is certainly in here, and again, you can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it didn't come from uh, okay. didn't come from Heidegger. No, no, it was more uh, uh, Henri Lefebvre, Guy Debord, and Jean Paul Sartre. You know, in, in that in that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And radical imagination was really from Castellaravis, who actually framed the the the, the notion back in sixty. I think of 63, 64, he articulated this, but we, we mean by it a kind of politics of memory, too, and, you know, to set it off from productive imagination, I mean, I certainly do, productive imagination, uh, uh, you know, critical imagination and conservative imagination. Mm-hmm. So the radical imagination is really an attempt towards the rerouting of, you know, imaginative works in the history that cannot be totally co-opted by the system, and then also, how do you produce new form? You know, Very similar new to the form. Idea of futurality of the Heidegger. 
What's that? I'm sorry. It's very similar to the way Heidegger talks yes. about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we don't have a hope unless we think this future will possibility. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's another thing too. I mean, Benjamin used to say, "Defined hope. We must have hope for those without hope, for mm -hmm. those who do not have hope." And you know, Bloch wrote a book called *The Principle of Hope*. And as some of you know who read Camus, hope is the last thing out of Pandora's box, and it's the most evil of um, emotions. <laughs> this devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Anyway. Hope is the thing with feathers. Oh yeah. What does that mean? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm and that's kidding. Emily Dickinson. <laughs> I know. I remember. Yeah. Huh? The solitary. And then Woody Allen wrote a book called Without Feathers. Without feathers, right? Yeah. Woody Allen. Yeah. <laughs> Hopeless. <laughs> His wife, ex-wife, is coming to the Polk Awards, I learned. Oh, I see. I'm going to try to sit at the same table. <laughs> Mia Farrow. Yeah, because her son's getting an award. Watch her. What's that? I'll, I will watch out, yeah. I'll <laughs> ask her about Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go from like Frank? Like the originator of Me Too. So. Oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. The letter. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Mia right. Farrow, right? Was she in Rosemary's Baby? Was yeah. that her big yeah. claim? Yeah. The big yeah. claim to fame was Rosemary's Baby, huh? Yeah. yeah. Where's Fred Sparrow playing? You don't know, I guess. Anybody know? Probably everywhere. I'm sure everywhere. It's like a mainstream movie. It is, yeah. You can see it anywhere. It's at the AMC, huh? Yeah. yeah. Court Street. Court Street AMC. Yeah. That, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a student as the assistant manager there. <laughs> what are you doing here, Professor? Oh, I don't what know. Do I, I come to be movies <laughs> in the movies. afternoon when I have nothing better to do. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So the new cards are seven ninety five, these cinema cards that you can get in? Uh, seven yeah, we're finished.